good evening everybody and good afternoon to professor david nicole and good morning to professor sandy shrinivas from united states welcome all of you to the euro oncology sub specialty webinar today on testicular cancer but before we start i have a very sad news to share with all of you yesterday we had the professor shivdev shriram bapat a legend in urology in india who left us for heavenly abode yesterday so uh, i would want all of you to keep a 30 minute silence in uh, as an obituary condolence for him we have sent a condolence message to his family members before we start this meeting i would request all of you to observe 30 seconds silence Hmm. and on behalf of the urological society of india i would extend a warm welcome to professor david nicole who is the professor of surgical oncology and chief uh, urologist at the royal marsden hospital in london and professor sandy shrinivas the medical oncologist at the stanford university and we have eminent indian faculty who are participating in this webinar and uh, this webinar will be moderated today by dr gagan and dr joy chakraborty we have two sessions one of them will be lectures on testicular cancer and the other session would be a panel discussion with this introduction i would request now dr sim malikarjuna president urological society of india to give his opening remarks over to you dr malikarjuna well, thank you kesho thank you very much i think we we'll, we we'll, we'll, we'll miss uh, professor bapat as you said and uh, rest in peace for him Great. and uh, thank you sandy and uh, thank you david for joining Uh, for today and uh, with a galaxy of indian faculty on testicular cancer i think i still remember 20 years ago we were restricted only up to high orchidectomy and rest is taken care of by somebody else which urologists never knew what happened to the patient but it is a sea change which has happened in the last 20 years i think everybody is understanding the pathology and possibly the treatment plans much better and much better understanding between the medical oncologists the surgical and the urologists and the radiation guys which has led to this sort of a fantastic way of managing testicular tumors but anyway still i think this uh, program will be of great use for the people because majority of the urologists still don't understand it much uh, as in that depth but i think this with this session would be definitely be of a great use for the urologists and the urologist members of the urological society of india thank you very much again sandy and david for joining us for the Here, time in this weekend, which is mostly very precious for you two guys, and uh, thank you very much for joining, and all the best for this program, Raghu, Joy, and uh, uh, and Gagan on this on this day. Thank you very much, Kesha. Go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Malik Ajun. Now I would invite Professor Rajiv Sood, Chairman of the Indian School of Urology, for his opening remarks. Over to you, Dr. Rajiv. Thank you, Dr. Kesha. Uh, this is the time uh, you, for uh, Euro Onco Specialty, another uh, webinar of the year. and uh, remembering dr s s bapat it is a, he was not only a legend he was a, we i had worked with him very closely he was a, in fact my moral mentor also so it is so sad to be do, doing any activity without him unimaginable but we have to live with it and uh, we have to get going the euro oncology sub specialty cell is to be congratulated for crafting this wonderful program with the two sessions testicular cancer is in focus today and uh, eminent uh, national faculty is uh, um, supported by um, today dr david nicole and uh, uh, professor uh, sandy uh, shrinivas 
and we are going to be immensely benefited. It is not only the management which we are discussing in the first session, but also the RPLND and the addition of the technology that is to robotic technology. And uh, we will be discussing about that for, followed by panel discussion. So I hope the, in the multimodality management of radiotherapy and uh, uh, surgery and other aspects, we will be completely discussing the contemporary care of testicular cancer. It is uh, again, greetings from Indian School of Urology and uh, let us uh, wish uh, great success to this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sood. Now I would invite Dr. Gagan and uh, Dr. Jai Chakravorty to take over and moderate these sessions on testicular cancer. And Dr. Amlesh Seth would be chairing the first session and uh, Dr. Sanjay Adla would be moderating the panel discussion. Over to you, Dr. Gagan, for the overview of this webinar. Uh, thank you, sir. Honorary President and Secretary, Urological Society of India, Honorary Chairman and Co-Chair, Indian School of Urology and all the esteemed faculty. I would like to talk about this webinar on behalf of the Urology subsection of USI, which has five members who have contributed towards planning and organizing this academic activity. Testicular cancer affects men in the most productive years of life, but thankfully has the best survival amongst all solid organ cancers if managed at high volume centers. There seems to be a global concern about rise in incidence of this cancer. I strongly feel, and I think possibly other senior members would agree, that performing a good RPLND is a prominent milestone in the evolution of a urologist who's dealing with cancer. It definitely amplifies your confidence as a surgeon and makes you comfortable in the retroperitoneum, which maybe we would call as the urologist's or uro-oncologist's playground or zone. I would like to proudly mention that uh, every faculty that you would listen to today has an immense experience in dealing with this, with this cancer. And uh, we are happy to have Professor David Nicole and Professor Sandy Shinivas, about whom you've already heard. Let's dive into this academic program. Dr. Joy Chakrabarti is a senior urologist and a member of the subcommittee will moderate the program with me. And uh, I would like to invite Professor Amlesh, Amlesh Seth, head of urology department at Ames Delhi to chair the session. Uh, Dr. Jayan Kulkarni was supposed to be chairing the session with him is unable to join us this evening. Uh, over to you, Dr. Joy, to invite the first speaker to start the program. Yeah, Thank am you, I Dr. audible? Yes. Oh. yes. Thank you, Professor Thank Omalas Seth, um, uh, to chair the session. I would like to first invite uh, Dr. Jitin Jayapriya. Uh, he is a senior consultant onco -uro oncologist from Rajiv Gandhi Cancer Institute, and uh, he will uh, give his talk on evaluation and management of testicular mass. Now the stage is yours. Jitin, are you here? Thank you, sir. I hope I'm well audible. Yeah. Okay. So Go on, let please. Me... Oh, yes. Good evening and greetings from Rajiv Gandhi Cancer Institute. Today we will deliberate on evaluation and initial management of a testicular mass. I shall aim to give a good general overview with deliberation and specific controversial and neglected aspects. There is a lot of ground to cover, though I shall try to be comprehensive. I suggest residents to revisit the recording and see the material on slides in detail. So testicular cancer is the most common cancer in men of reproductive potential and patients may present with any of palpable abnormality of testis, local symptoms or specific symptoms due to metastatic disease. Sometimes you may get referral for an incident abnormality on a USB scan also. Uncommon manifestations can include gynecomasia, which is particularly common with Leydig cell tumors. Rarely testicular cancers can cause paraneoplastic hyperthyroidism and limbic encephalitis. So when clinically examining patients, it is essential to start with the normal site first so as to have a baseline for comparing the disease fauna. Rarely you may discover synchronous malignancy there. Any firm hard or fixed area within the substance of the tunica albuginia should be considered suspicious until proven otherwise. But it is imperative to not forget other differential diagnosis from the general surgical practice. 
It is also vital to not miss the abdomen and nodal patients for clinical evidence of systemic meds or endocrine manifestations. All patients undergoing evaluation for testicular cancer should be offered a testicular ultrasound, which is an extension of your physical exam. It is highly sensitive, but lacks specificity with an MRI also cannot improve, and it is also inaccurate for the assessment of local invasion. Though a positive sonogram is quite reliable in the correct clinical context with characteristic appearance of seminomas versus non-seminomas, sometimes it can add to confusion. Specifically, when faced with incidentally detected abnormalities, often seen with cancer for evaluation of male infertility. It is essential to remember that non-palpable intratesticular lesions are not infrequently uh, non-infrequent in the general population, and only the solid or mixed ecodensity ones need closer scrutiny. Now, while palpable solid masses are malignant in overwhelming majority, up to 80% of non-palpable solid lesions may be benign. Features suggestive of malignancy on a scan include association with testicular microlithiasis, ill-defined margins, and heterogeneous architecture, while benign lesions often have normal edges and parenchyma in association with macro calcifications. Lesions less than 5 mm are overwhelmingly benign, and hypoechogenicity and vascularity can be non-specific. Thus, when faced with an incidentally detected non-palpable mass, if an ultrasound feature suggests benignity with no high risk factors and lesion is small with negative tumor markers, USB surveillance may be a reliable alternative in younger patients. Now, testicular microlithiasis is another abnormality that you will often see. It's challenging because it's, again, not infrequent in general population, while there is evidence of association with pearl fold higher incidence of testicular cancer. Consensus is lacking on a uniform definition, and five or more microliths per field of view should be the preferred criteria. And interestingly, while clustered microliths correlate more with dysplastic regions, a higher microlith count is actually associated with less aggressive tumors. Now, the key concept is that TMLs and GCTs cluster together because of the common denominator of seminiferous tubule degeneration. TML does not independently increase the risk of development of testicular cancer. Hence, we should give importance to TML only in presence of additional risk factors, including prior personal or family history of GCT, testicular maldescent, or osteopexy, testicular atrophy with less than 12 ml volume, genetic syndrome, or presence of symptoms. Thus, you don't need to follow up ultrasounds for incidentally detected testicular microlith in absence of other risk factors. Now, coming to lab work, beta, LCG, AFB, and LDH remain the mainstay, but they you know, lack sufficient diagnostic accuracy and may not be elevated in 40% cases. The conventional dictum has been that if AFP is elevated, then seminoma is ruled out, but it is increasingly being recognized that low-level elevations of AFP can be seen in less than 3% of seminomas for different reasons and don't need deviations in treatment plan. STMs carry diagnostic and prognostic significance and correlate with tumor aggressiveness and burden and should be assessed at the time of initial diagnosis and four weeks after orchidectomy. Baseline assessment of an adult function is not routinely indicated but should be performed in specific instances such as abnormality of four testes, infertility, clinical features of hormonal excess or deficit, or suspicion of heritable genetic syndrome affecting the gonad. Moving to imaging aspects, CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis forms the center's own of radiological assessment and should be offered to all. CT test should be done if abdominal CT or test X-ray is positive and do not forget brain MRI in those with high levels of beta SCG, non-pulmonary visceral meds, or extensive lung meds. Now, the main CT criteria for discriminating suspicious nodes is size and morphology, and MRI is not superior, hence not preferred unless radiation exposure is a particular concern. The role of FDT PET is mainly restricted to assessment of post chemo residual masses and seminomas. Its role in assessment of post chemo masses in NSDCT is controversial because it cannot reliably discriminate necrosis star and teratoma. Radiological findings of small pulmonary nodules is a common occurrence with nodules with long diameter less than 9 mm can be safely followed up unless there is teratoma in the primary specimen. Lastly, now let's talk about the surgical management aspects. It is a dictum to perform all surgeries for malignancy of the testis via the inguinal approach, as total violation is associated with higher rates of local recurrence and altered pathways of metastatic dissemination. Though radical orchidectomy is the gold standard, testis sparing surgery can be considered in circumstances such as synchronous bilateral tumors, mass in a solitary testicle, or mass in a sol functionally solitary testicle. It should also be considered in assessment of those with non pancreatic te testicular masses less than 2 cm, as majority of these are benign. It is customary to give adjuvant RT if you find germ cell neoplasia and C2 or testicular cancer. Patients should be aware of the increased risk of local recurrence after partial orchidectomy, which can reach 10.9%. And 9.3% patients with total violation are found to harbor residual primary tumor after total scar excision. 
However, it does not appear to impact subsequent Mets and survival in the short term. So in conclusion, short, close monitoring may be appropriate for most patients with total violation with shared decision-making utilized for local RT for seminoma and star excision for NSPCT. Now coming to evaluation of contralateral testing, because patients with unilateral testicular GCT have the highest known fact, uh, risk for developing a contralateral uh, testicular GCT, it is potentially advantageous to identify those who are destined to develop a second testicular neoplasm. The underlying concept is that all testicular cancers originate from a common precursor lesion called GCNIS, and these cells develop in utero while maturing during puberty. So majority of patients harboring GCNIS will develop frank testicular cancers in due time, and we can reliably identify them by their appearance in ISC. And they are relatively widely distributed over a large area, such that a two-point biopsy can pick it up with less than 0.5% false negative rate. We can reliably treat them with local RT while preserving the hormonal function of the testis. So contralateral testicular biopsy offers three advantages. If DCNIS is found, you stand to treat malignancy in its infancy. If biopsy is negative, then you have peace of mind as de novo DCNIS does not arise in adulthood. Lastly, you also have high quality information about fertility. But the debate mainly arises because contralateral DCNIS is present in less than 5% cases, thus over treating a large majority and treating it does not improve survival. Although smaller studies support screening for GCNIS, two large real-world studies fail to show reduction in development of contralateral testicular tumor by doing these biopsies. However, they had limitations where there was lack of pathological expertise in routine ISC testing, as well as biopsying only one site, which has high false negative rates. So the middle ground lies in considering contralateral testicular biopsies in those where you have uh, select cases with cryptocardism, atrophic testes, microcalcifications, or extra gonadal GCTs to look for testicular primary, and in those with young age. Coming to the last issue of sperm ranking, due to multiple reasons affecting spermatogenesis as well as fertility, it is not surprising to find 50% of patients with testicular cancer having impaired fertility at presentation. And 25% are actually age of spermic even prior to treatment and they would further get subsequent gonadotoxic therapy. Now, recovery time frames following surgery, RT or chemo can easily reach two years with successful conception rates falling shy of 60% in many instances. So it is sad that despite strong guideline recommendations, less than 30% patients get offered fertility preservation. Fertility planning should be the part of care plan right after diagnosis before radical orchidectomy. Provided other hormonal issues are absent, initial semen analysis should guide the subsequent pathway. Those azospermic or severely azospermic at diagnosis should be offered micro dissection testicular sperm extraction at the time of orchidectomy, and we also know it as oncomicro TC. Management of post treatment infertility in the post chemotherapy uh, setting should be micro TC. So, while in the post RPLND setting, there is an opportunity to use alpha adrenergic or electrostimulation. I think uh, this is all that we can cover in seven minutes. Thank you for the patient listening. Thank you, Jitain. You have been very precise and very, very quick. You have covered so many aspects in such a short while. In fact, in one of the chat messages, one of the messages is, has been that you have been too fast. Uh, <laughs> but I think you have covered the whole thing very well. And obviously, there are uh, most of the things are well kind of uh, are unambiguous. The main controversy is actually in the biopsy of the contralateral testis. The rest of the things are uh, more or less uh, well established and uh, the guidelines are very clear. So uh, if there are any questions regarding that, uh, or maybe you would like to uh, speak one or two more sentences regarding uh, the, in your practice, how many times have you needed to do a biopsy of the contralateral testis? And uh, what have the indications in your own experience? Maybe that is something which might be relevant in the discussion. Uh, yes, sir. So, in, uh, so there are country to country differences in uh, you know how we approach contralateral testicular biopsy. So, uh, so far in the four years that I have been at RBCI, we haven't had that uh, you know specific situation where you had a tropic testis or those with cryptocardism or microcalcifications or uh, you know extragonadal DCT. So. Uh, 
like i said if these indications are present it's a good practice but again uh, less than 5% of patients would ultimately you know fit into any of these criteria so uh, uh, okay. personally i had no personal experience but i will consider it in these indications okay so it is needed very very rarely so that is the message okay so thank you very much so now we will go on to the next uh, speaker professor david nicole is going to speak on when is rplnd indicated in testicular cancer in fact this is the most important issue to be discussed today and as has already been pointed out by dr gagan prakash that ever since the integrated management multimodality management and integration of rplnd has come in the management of testicular cancer the cure rates have gone up even in advanced testicular cancer and this is a very important skill in the armamentarium of uro oncologists and this is what is going to be the main subject of discussion and the first speaker is professor david nicol he is uh, the chief of surgery at royal marsden hospital in london we all know royal marsden hospital has been on the forefront of managing testicular cancer for the last i would say half a century or more than half a century and before all these international classifications came the royal marsden classification was the standard classification that was used in all the textbooks and although there was no no official guidelines but whatever was the management protocol in royal marsden that was what was followed in europe and what was the guide, the pattern of management in indianapolis that is what was the management guideline used in in uh, usa and in our part of the world we used to use uh, the royal marsden guidelines and welcome professor david dicol who is chief of surgery at royal marsden hospital many thanks for the kind invitation to present in this very exciting session on testicular cancer i'd like to address the topic of when is retroperitoneal lymph node dissection indicated RPLD may be considered across the spectrum of disease at both the time of presentation and also subsequently. Currently, there are no indications for a role of retroperitoneal lymph node dissection in stage one seminoma. In contrast, it may be considered in select patients with stage one non-seminomas germ cell tumors. Stage one disease is categorized into those at high risk of relapse based upon lymphovascular invasion of whom 40 to 50% will subsequently relapse, which is then treated with multi-cycle cisplatinum based chemotherapy. In contrast, those without lymphovascular invasion are at low risk of recurrence as only 15% go on to exhibit relapse, which is treated similarly. Arpilin D has been described in high-risk stage one non-seminomonous germ cell tumors. With this, 70% are confirmed pathological stage one disease. Of these, 10% subsequently relapse, although this is predominantly at distant sites. 30% patients, however, will be found to be pathological stage two disease. And without further treatment, approximately 30% will relapse either in the retroperitoneum or at distant sites. Consequently, in this setting, adjuvant BEP may be employed. Nevertheless, we should be mindful that standard of care is regarded as adjuvant chemotherapy with which only 3% of patients will subsequently experience relapse. Consequently, I feel that it has a limited role in this setting and essentially only utilize Arpilin D has been described in high risk stage one non seminomonous germ cell tumors. With this, 70% are confirmed pathological stage one disease. Of these, 10% subsequently relapse, 
explosives predominantly at distant sites. 30% of patients, however, will be found to be pathological stage two disease. And without further treatment, approximately 30% will relapse either in the retroperitoneum or at distant sites. Consequently, in this setting, adjuvant BEP may be employed. Nevertheless, we should be mindful that standard of care is regarded as adjuvant chemotherapy with which only 3% of patients will subsequently experience relapse. Consequently, I feel that it has a limited role in this setting and essentially only utilized in patients unsuited to adjuvant chemotherapy. In contrast, primary RPMD is indicated in a number of rare testicular tumors, which are both chemo and radioresistant. These include postpubital teratoma, with the primary containing somatic type malignancy. Similarly, malignant gonadal stromal tumors, which are a small subset of Leydig and Satoli cell tumors, are chemo and radioresistant, and thus systemic disease is incurable. Thus, early RPND should be considered in these settings as potentially the only curative option for the patient. RPND is indicated in marker negative clinical stage two non seminominous germ cell tumors. This could be in the setting of nodal disease at the time of presentation or with relapse after initial surveillance of stage one disease. With that which occurs at presentation, small nodes which are evident on initial scans should be restaged as in many instances, this may be a reactive node and intervention is not required. With this strategy, patients are able to avoid unnecessary and toxic systemic therapy for what is otherwise a chemo-resistant disease. After ND, 10% of patients are downstaged and require no further treatment. Similarly, those with postpubital teratoma have completed treatment with surgery. In cases where histology demonstrates active disease, 30% will go on to develop subsequent relapse. These cases have two options, either adjuvant chemotherapy or surveillance, and then therapeutic chemotherapy when relapse occurs. With both of these options, the cure rate approaches 98%, and thus this is a matter for discussion with the individual patient. The role of RPND for stage two seminoma is currently under evaluation. A population study from the US reported 155 cases in this setting with an overall five-year survival rate of 92%, which was comparable to other treatments, that is radiotherapy and systemic chemotherapy. This data, however, provided no information on the relapse risk, other treatments, or disease-specific survival of the patient. Presently, two trials are underway, in the US and Germany, where RPND alone is employed for stage two seminoma. With this, 20 to 30% will relapse, although successfully treated with multi-agent chemotherapy. In my own institution, the Royal Marsden, we have a series of 51 patients who were initially treated with robotic retroperitoneal dissection and adjuvant carboplatin if pathological stage two disease was confirmed. With this, 10% were downstaged or had other diagnoses and thus avoided unnecessary treatment. At this stage, we have a single relapse of 18 months who was successfully treated with three cycles of BEP and remains disease-free two and a half years later. It's a situation here, I think, and it's not standard practice, but something we should potentially consider in the future, depending on maturation of data from the centers I've outlined. Most common utilization for RPND is for patients with residual masses following completion of chemotherapy. A bilateral template encompassing the renal vessels, common iliac arteries, and the ureters should be regarded as a standard of care. It is clearly mandatory if initial disease involved both the interaortocaval and left paraortic nodes. 
There is a role for modified templates, but this is only in the context of initial unilateral disease. And certainly, surgery should never involve resection of the mass alone. The application of salvage RPND is somewhat uncertain with seminoma. This can be technically profoundly challenging. And in fact, masses almost invariably shrink, but this may take several years. With growing masses, salvage treatments with chemotherapy and radiotherapy are regarded as a standard care. Nevertheless, in rare instances, it may be considered, but this is best defined as those with a nodular mass more than three centimeters in size and where all other options have been exhausted. Salvage setting, timing of RPL and D is a matter of judgment and experience and should not always be as soon as possible but rather allowing adequate time for the patient to fully recover from the effects of their systemic treatment. With multiple sites of disease, those are critical sites clearly take priority, with them the next being that of the highest volume of disease. A further point to consider is that the histology at one site is not always predictive of that at others, and consequently all should be resected. Patients who failed systemic options, who have significantly elevated or rising tumour markers, what may be termed desperation, RPLND, can be considered. This, however, should be only if all sites of disease are felt to be resectable. In the scenario of a low-level plateaued elevation of alpha-beta protein, approximately 50% will have necrosis and teratoma only in the specimen with a subsequent good prognosis. In contrast, those with substantially elevated or rising markers, while 60% may achieve a serological remission with surgery, 80% will subsequently relapse and prove incurable. A further uncommon scenario for RPLND is in the growing teratoma syndrome. And this is the patient with an increasing mass after normalization of markers at mid-treatment with cystic features of the retroperitoneal mass as shown here in this particular case. In this scenario, proceeding immediately to retroperitoneal lymph node dissection should be undertaken without completion of chemotherapy. Surgery is also indicated in the difficult situation of relapse which is where disease recurs more than two years after a successful initial primary treatment. This can occur many years after initial diagnosis. It can comprise postpubital teratoma, which may have features of dedifferentiation, as well as what is often termed a chemotherapy-induced yolk sac tumour, manifesting as a mass in association with a modest elevation of the alpha beta protein. The retroperitoneum is the most common site, with this reflecting either inadequate initial surgery or observed residual masses. Late relapses, except those with HCG elevations, are almost invariably chemo-resistant, and surgery must be performed whenever feasible. Chemotherapy may be considered initially, but only to render the disease resectable. Otherwise, these patients are incurable. I'd like to highlight several mistakes occur that occur with the utilization of RPL and D. These can include poorly performed surgery, as well as unnecessary surgery for the incorrect indications. Similarly, you must be aware of the fact that the option of surgery is overlooked and the patient subjected to additional chemotherapy which is unnecessary and of essentially little gain. We're also critically dependent upon the histological interpretation and radiological recognition of features which would lead patients to surgical intervention. As a final slide, I'd like to make these following points that RPL and D is critical to the curative treatment of testicular cancer in selected settings. It's an uncommon and technically challenging procedure, 
which is best managed in high volume centres with multidisciplinary involvement of urologists, oncologists, pathologists and radiologists with formal discussion of all testicular cases involving these specialty groups, irrespective of stage. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Professor David Nicole. A very interesting presentation. There are quite a few questions that have been asked in the chat box. Uh, should I go one by one or should I give you all the questions in one go and then you'll answer them all in one go? Maybe one by one. I often miss points and get confused. Okay, okay, okay. The first question is regarding the variant type of testicular tumors. Uh, so what should be the templates in variant types of testicular tumors? Uh, so... I, I, so uh, uh, I, I take okay. it that you... Uh, Professor uh, David, that was uh, my question. So uh, the reason I'm asking is that uh, we would be wanting to do an rpl in uh, uh, variant or rare tumors, even when the and tumors which are chemo-resistant, even when there is no mass seen in the retroperitoneum. Correct. Yeah. Uh, now, whereas we are tempted to reduce the morbidity in uh, these rpl by considering, say, nerve sparing or an extra peritoneal or a robotic, but at the same time, we are uh, concerned about a more aggressive cancer uh, with these. Uh, so, you know, should we always do a standard even though there are no nodes or there is a room for a, a less invasive or no sparing RPL in the invariants? Um, in, in my opinion, these diseases are absolutely incurable anything else. And so radicality underpins the intervention. Um, and I'd highlight uh, P-net tumors, which we've seen a few of. And typically they can have actually microscopic deposits within multiple nodes. And given we know about crossover, so I think essentially if you leave a node there, that's a missed opportunity for cure if it contains disease. And so I don't think they'd be compromised because once these diseases have radiologically evident nodes, they often do very poorly with surgery at that point. So I think stage one disease and aggressive consideration of R, P, and D. Um, the other point with that is that it's very important that an experienced histopathologist looks at Leydig and Satoli cell tumours because, in fact, it's actually very rare that they have the true malignant features, and so it's rarely done in that. But if anything's got PNET or D-differentiated teratoma in the primary, I'd be suggesting that a fairly radical primary r and d is the treatment of choice. So if you find PNET in the primary, you would definitely go ahead with a very extensive retroperitoneal lymph node dissection as early as possible. Yes. Okay, now the second question is regarding seminoma of the testis. After chemotherapy, you mentioned that the mass may keep on regressing over a period of one or two years. Hmm. And this has been observed very commonly. And yep. it has also been observed that FDG PET may remain positive for some time even after completion of yep. chemotherapy. So there are two questions that have been asked. Number one, how long do you wait and how do you decide which patient to take up for surgery? And the second question is, if these patients are taken up for surgery, are these patients taken up for excision of only the mass or for full bilateral RPLND? Um, I, I guess this is a very difficult area and there's not a lot of clarity and you look at Memorial and other institutions, it's not clear even how those institutions treat it. So it's often on a patient by patient basis. Uh, the, the key points I think are you've got to leave the pet for at least six months in my experience because you often get warm uptake in a regressing mass. And so the only really in, indication would be if someone's got a growing mass, again, this is outside my field, but consideration of high dose chemotherapy or if radiotherapy wasn't used initially to add it at that point. And so if we have a primary um, chemotherapy failure, we'd move on to um, radiotherapy to the mass. The retroperitoneum can be profoundly challenging with an intense sort of diffuse desmoplastic reaction. This is in the large, patient, large mass initially that's regressed. And so in the limited cases that we do, you, you try and limit the damage and often the renal vessels are a specific point of concern, but excising the mass, I think is probably the safest option. 
um, in, in that sort of setting. Um, so, um, yes, it, it, it's a difficult area. To, Thank you. No. So what you are saying is that you would like it to wait at least for six months and if the mass continues yeah. to regress, then you would like to wait. Yeah. And secondly, if you go in, then you would like to excise just the residual mass rather than going bilaterally. And my question now to you is, what and is... Just the... at, at one point with that, the other factor to consider is the size of initial mass. If you've got a 15 centimeter mass and that comes down to four centimeters, that's a pretty good result. If someone's got a five centimeter mass that sits at three centimeters, that's a, a less satisfactory result. So you have to contextualize the initial bulk of disease and the mass with three centimeters really just being an arbitrary cutoff point. And what about the role of radiotherapy in post chemotherapy situation for seminoma? Because it is a highly radiosensitive tumor, but in the post chemotherapy yeah. situation, uh, how often do you use and uh, what, uh, what are the results? Um, I guess then, well, I guess firstly, we use chemotherapy for 2C, so, so bulky seminome we tend to treat, and they're the ones with, which have some masses left. And in that setting, if they remain very pet avid, we would certainly proceed with uh, radiotherapy to that. Um, and in fact, the, the instances of need for RPMD with that strategy is, is fairly small. So I, I really have, wouldn't have... I do about 50 RPMDs a year and I would probably do a seminar every two years. Okay. Right. Uh, there were other questions also. I'll have to go back to the chat box. Uh, so, I was, because, uh, you know, there are so many okay. questions. I'm, uh, okay, I'm wondering we will if leave Professor... the questions to the panel yeah. discussion. Okay. Yeah. And uh, Professor David, it would be great if you could... Uh, take some of the questions in the chat box because we are running out of time for the okay. uh, subsequent talks here. Yeah. yeah. So I could just type them in. Yeah, that would, that would be great. Sorry for that. Okay. So now the next part is when and how I do it, the retroperitoneal lymphoid dissection. So for extra peritoneal, Ginil and Ravi Mohan Mahudru, they are the people who are going to speak on the so, Ginil Kumar, we all know, he is from Amrita Institute. He is a professor of urology and neuro-oncology. And Dr. Ravi Mohan Mahudru is at PGI Chandigarh, and he is also a well-known urologist, known well to all of us. So, I invite Dr. Ginil first, and then Dr. Ravi Mohan Mahudru to speak about extra-peritoneal, retro-peritoneal lymphoid dissection. I think uh, Ravi Mohan is starting the discussion. I will follow, sir. Okay. okay. Uh, I'm not able to share my screen, sir, somehow. I was trying to do that. Am I audible, sir? Yes, you are audible, but we can't see your screen. Yeah, I'm just doing that. Somehow it is not coming up. Yeah, I got it. So I believe it is seen now? Yes, 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 it is seen now. So thank you, uh, USISU, and especially Gagan and uh, Joy for this uh, wonderful learning opportunity. And the uh, topic assigned to me is extra peritoneal dissection, when and how I do it. Uh, I have a disclaimer that I've done a lot of uh, trans but I've not done a single extra peritoneal. But then uh, as I went in the preparation of this uh, talk, I realized that we as a urologist, uh, the entire organ is, is all lying in the retro -peritoneum. And then we've been doing everything trans -peritoneal. But it makes sense that we should uh, uh, we should be doing uh, more uh, approaching it in an extra peritoneal way rather than going to trans peritoneal. So this is a small video which was shared by uh, Gagan, uh, where one of his uh, fellow did a uh, midline extra peritoneal uh, retro peritoneal lymph node dissection, and uh, this gave me a very good impetus. So we actually planned uh, another alkalinity next week, uh, trying to replicate this. So you can clearly see that they run a long midline incision. The body habitus is average. And then as you see, yeah, the retroperitoneum is very nicely exposed. They performed the lymph node dissection. So that's the aorta. And then they have removed all the interaortocable uh, tissues. That's the IVC. You can see the ureter very well preserved and, and the entire uh, tissue on the right side has been done. And similarly with the same approach, they would, uh, they have mobilized the peritoneum on the other side and uh, did a complete bilateral RPLND. So I think 
looking at this video it seems quite feasible to do a extra peritoneal uh, midline uh, rpl nd so i think we're playing the video again Somehow it's not moving ahead. So uh, with this, I would uh, stop here. The main main question is whether to do trans or extra. I think the literature wise, we don't have any evidence. And uh, we have Dr. Ginnell, who is a who is the master of uh, robotic extra peritoneal lymph node dissection. I'll hand it over to him. Uh, and as he will talk, he will also address some other questions associated with that. Dr. Ginnell. Thank you, Ravi. Uh, can you share the? Yeah, we can see your slides. Sir. Okay, so I'll uh, I'll optimize and then share. So uh, same question: Why should we go transperitoneal when it is possible extraperitoneal? That is applicable to a robotic also. So in this video, in this uh, presentation, I'm just discussing about extra peritoneal approach for RPLND. It is well described with laparoscopy, but was not attempted in robotics. So we plan to do it extra peritoneally. This is the uh, positioning the patient uh, on. Uh, usually we approach from the right side, but left side also we have started to do. Uh, right side is easier. Even uh, we can go across uh, up to the opposite. The robot position is here and uh, monitors are on the opposite side. Uh, surgeon, assistant, and nurse are the same side. So uh, this is a procedure which uh, we published the initial case. This is a position, supine position, just tilt the patient. Then with the, we, with the finger, we don't have the, uh, uh, the uh, other instruments like balloon. So we use the finger under camera guidance after entering into the extrapetonic space. We create the initial space and uh, put the put the other ports under finger guidance. After uh, putting the all the ports, this is the port position, and uh, the camera is put through a, uh, a robotic port uh, through the usual port, 12 mm port, uh, which is used for finger guidance, and uh, rest of the ports are put. So lower is for scissors, upper is for bipolar and uh, uh, progress. So first the psoas is. Uh, identified and we climb along the zoas. Then the ureter is identified and uh, ureter is dissected down and uh, separated from the tumor. Then the gonadal vessels we identify and uh, dissect it up to the external ring. Sometimes we may have to swap the pores to get the distal end. We can go across, this is the opposite ureter we can see here. We can go up to that level across the across the great vessels and just dissect the entire lymph node uh, mass from the IVC and the iota. And this is the intra cavity that is dissected and just uh, putting the putting a very short clip. Um, we climb along the uh, large vessels and uh, dissect the intra Why I would like to have a stepitonal because one, there are some concerns about losing the tissue and uh, peritoneal deposit in robotic when we are doing a uh, uh, transperitoneal approach. Here we are peeling off the tissue uh, from the great vessels as a, uh, as a bunch without uh, dissecting into piecemeal. So the removal is uh, complete. And also uh, uh, since there is a new more, the chance of oozing from the vein is very less and we can very well control the posterior vessels of, uh, from the IVC and the IOTA better than from the anterior aspect. So uh, the, the, uh, the concern is whether we have got adequate space. You can see that there is adequate space in the uh, extra peritoneum to manage everything what we want. These are the, uh, the urinal vessel of the left side is the artery crossing and uh, we can go across to the opposite side. From the right side, we can easily go to the opposite side. And uh, we have preserved the nerves also in the other side. So 
majority of the case, we preserve the inferior mesenteric artery because it is very easy to preserve in the extrapedonic group using robot. This, all the cases are uh, post chemotherapy. Few of the cases we have uh, preserved the nerves, but it is very difficult in the post chemotherapy scenario. So we remove the bunch of the uh, tumor and uh, we uh, small tumors. This is a space I'm telling. This is very, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, the advantage is all the tumors are easy to uh, uh, retrieve. So uh, concern, uh, uh, the advantage is we are not going into the bowel. Export is good and uh, intrapitoneal seeding can be awarded. Um, can we do large masses? That will be the question which may be asked. So this is a large mass uh, 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 retrocaval. This was a uh, uh, growing teratoma after chemotherapy. Yeah, I'm, I'm lifting the huge mass uh, behind the vein and uh, removing it uh, uh, this across the vein. It was like a dumbbell mass across the, uh, behind the IVC and uh, going to the opposite side. So uh, this much large masses can be removed through the, uh, through the retropectonia. So uh, uh, we, can, uh, we can very well manage the bleeders and lumbar veins in the resident because advantages we are approaching from behind. So suturing is possible. We can, uh, 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 lumbar veins and lumbar arteries can be uh, very well uh, managed from behind. So uh, even though uh, uh, the, the completion of dissection, I can lift the iota like this and go behind. And opposite uh, side dissection also is very much possible uh, even behind the iota. So I just want to demonstrate that extra approach is, a, uh, is uh, possible. Well, if there is any entry into petroleal cavity, just tip the Tony lips or put a berries and we can proceed. So uh, I just want to demonstrate uh, extra petroleum, which is a uh, 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 thing that I was developing. We have done around uh, 10 cases. Um, yeah, Transpetroleum is the commonest route. I have done only two, three when I wanted to convert it uh, uh, because of loss of no, no petroleum because of fixation to great vessel. Uh, one of the patients I couldn't complete transpetroleum load, so I have to go for. Uh, uh, Often. So, this is how I do uh, RPLMD. Thank you, Ravi. So, Ginil, that is very impressive. Uh, so, how many have you done right sided? How many left sided? How many bilateral? Yeah. Actually, uh, all my patients are uh, uh, post chemotherapy. I go for mm -hmm. a bilateral dissection. I usually approach from the right side, but uh, last case we had from left side also, we started. That was actually for a, uh, uh, or a lip node mask for other uh, issue, like there was a recurrence after uh, renal tumor excision in the retropetone. But thing is, both sides it is possible, but easier from the right side. We can approach across to the opposite side. So if it is a right-sided testicular tumor, you will begin and complete from the right side. And if it is a left-sided testicular tumor, yeah. you'll begin and complete from the left side. Uh, uh, I'll, uh, I used to side. go from the right side and uh, completely, if I'm planning for a bilateral, but left side, if it is a limited dissection, uh, template dissection, we are doing. Otherwise, uh, bilateral uh, dissection, probably uh, a right side approach is better. And what will you do to the inferior mesenteric artery? Usually, I preserve all the cases I could preserve. But if you are uh, dissecting and uh, cutting, uh, um, dividing the inferior, the space may be even better. Because going on to the opposite side without dividing the inferior mesenteric yeah. artery. Yeah, yeah we can dissect it and skeletonize so that uh, we will get adequate space. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure the most common fear that any surgeon, RPLND surgeon has is how to manage the major vessel injury, the vena cava injury and uh, the aortic injury. So what, what kind of guidelines would you give? Because you showed this aortic injury managed very well, but uh, everybody may not be as lucky. What do you, or what do you think that with robotic chances these injuries are less or they are managed better? 
what is your uh, opinion so and experience extra perineal approach we are doing it in the supine position there is no need to reposition the patient that is one advantage of extra perineal approach transperineal also majority of the case uh, you will be able to uh, uh, if we can identify the bleeder we can just uh, very well like it uh, robotically itself i think uh, dr kochikar has uh, raised his hand for a question so Yes. Sorry, the chatbot was disabled, so that's why I was asking this question. Excellent video, Jinil. Just wanted to know, as Amalesh has pointed out, one of the drawbacks for minimally invasive surgery is to have a proper vascular control in a major sort of a catastrophe like an aortic injury or a vena cava injury. So transperitoneal uh, open approach would have a good sort of an exposure all around. Perhaps maybe indicated in difficult situations like a dumbbell shaped mass, what we showed. Otherwise, straightforward, uh, you know, prophylactic arpillendias could be done retroperitoneal in a minimally invasive. That's the point I was making. Thank you. Actually, we can clamp the aorta, sir, because we are we actually clamp the aorta for aorto femoral bypass. We are attempting uh, to this route, so we could clamp the aorta from the side clamp. So, oh, Ginil, what we generally do is, if there's a difficult case, we clamp the aorta in the supraceliac area. Yeah. If there is a okay. chance, especially if there is a left-sided tumor, and there is a good chance that we may land up with a left nephrectomy, and if there is no space available between the mass and the aorta, and uh, on the CT scan, the artery is seen as if totally engulfed by the mass, and we may have to divide the artery almost flush with the aorta, and 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 so that button hole that is made in the aorta for that kind of a situation we are practices to control the aorta in the supraceliac area and that kind of a control is not what is uh, because the problem is not the lumbar arteries the problem is not the intermesenteric artery the problem is actually if the left renal artery is has to be divided almost at the aorta or very close to the aorta. That is the biggest trouble. And for that, you need a control of the supraceliac aorta rather than of the infra, infra hilar aorta. Yes, so I think uh, we'll one. have to go to the okay, next okay. talk. In, uh... Okay. So the next Thanks. talk is by... Uh, it's on robotic RPLND. Sorry, nurse bearing RPLND. Dr. Anand Raja and Dr. Mahindra Pal are the speakers. Uh, my screen is visible. No, am I not yet. Am I, am I you audible? Are audible, but your screen is not visible. Okay. Okay. Uh, now is it, is it visible? Is it? Yes, yes. Your screen has come. Yes. Okay. Go ahead, Mahinder. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Gagan and Dr. Joy for the opportunity. So this uh, uh, session, uh, Dr. Anand Raja will be speaking uh, after me and Ivan covering uh, uh, the one, one uh, short video of uh, nerve sparing RPLND, how uh, we do it. So this is uh, our faculty in uh, and, uh, at EMH. And uh, as uh, uh, we all uh, uh, know that uh, the nerves around the great vessels that uh, a sympathetic chain and fibers travels uh, uh, in front of the aorta and internal cable, they go uh, behind the IVC to connect to the contralateral uh, uh, sympathetic uh, chain. And uh, uh, the, how we choose the patient, the nurse bearing RPLND should be offered to the highly selected patients who are, who are contraindicated to chemotherapy and unwilling, for, uh, unwilling of active surveillance and selected cases of uh, stage 2A NSGCT and should be done by, and done by the experienced surgeon or in a uh, very high volume center uh, who are doing the surgery uh, routinely. So our patient is 25 year old male, unmarried, Having occurred apexy in eight to five year, he had raised uh, tumor marker, right testicular uh, uh, mass uh, uh, on CT scan. It's a para erotic erotic cable node, and uh, HIO was done. That shows a uh, high risk uh, energy CT because right testicular involved and the size was uh, uh, six centimeter and LVI present and carcinoma in situ. Uh, we repeat serum markers after six weeks. That were normal 
and uh, uh, CT scan showed the same uh, lesion in the retroperitoneum. Patient counseled about the chemotherapy and uh, primary nerve sparing RPL ND with advantage, advantages, and he opted for uh, uh, nerve sparing uh, RPL ND. So, how we uh, went ahead with the surgery? So, the primary request is, is, is uh, to proper exposure. So, retroperitoneal exposure after lifting the bowel with the root of mesentery and uh, the bilateral uh, the, uh, template is uh, defined, as we all know, uh, by the let uter laterally and hilum superiorly and common iliac nodes uh, inferiorly. Uh, utmost care to be taken to ligate the lymphatics is the right renal vein. This is the left ureter uh, being identified and looped. So this is the template, the IVC. This is the nodal mass in intertrochable region. And this is the aorta being marked. This is the ureter. So this is the, our uh, template of uh, uh, nerve sparing rpl -ND. So nerve sparing rpl -ND, we have to split and roll over the IVC. As we know that uh, the nerve fibers are behind the IVC. And uh, because this node was superficial, so first we remove the node to uh, get uh, exposure of Check the uh, nerves. And by the sharp dissection, uh, we awesome. identify the nerve. One thing is which I found that one nerve leads to other nerves. So once you find the one nerve, be very careful not to injure that. Once you lose that, you will not find the, be difficult to find the other nerves. So once it loop and with the traction and sharp dissection, the fibrofatty tissue is been dissected uh, from the nerves. So this is the intraoto cable, uh, uh, nodal tissue has been removed. Going towards the uh, retro cable area, this is the para cable region where we identified the sympathetic chain uh, and the nerves uh, joining uh, the sympathetic chain. This is para. Now, this is the pre erotic uh, uh, nodal has been dissected. Around the hilar area, we have to be very, very, very careful. Uh, because these the nerve fibers are a little bit thin and we have to apply clips to avoid uh, lymphoria. So clips are uh, applied and uh, tissue is removed. Uh, this is the one lumbar vein is there and uh, uh, the sympathetic chain over there near the renal vein at the right side, it is being looped. This is the uh, sympathetic uh, uh, plexus ar around the mesenteric artery that being uh, preserved. If you can uh, see the nerve fibers being lifted and all uh, uh, fiber fatty tissue between the nerve being dissected. We can see the endomesenteric artery. Uh, this is the tissue that has been, will also be removed. So this is the final uh, Complete template dissection was done with preservation of all the nerve bundles. Here are the para, para cable nerve fibers. So this is the uh, final picture with the diagnostic presentation. Uh, we can see hypogastric plexus, if IMA, and all the nerve fibers. So this is the final picture showing all the nerves which were preserved. So uh, the tips and trick which I uh, learned and I uh, follow that, the principle is we have to preserve the bilateral sympathetic chains whenever possible, post-ganglionic sympathetic fibers and hypogastric plexus to be identified and preserved. Uh, the basic requirement is in-depth understanding of the retroperitoneal anatomy and its common variation and excellent exposure of the retroperitoneum. Uh, and the other uh, tips and tricks uh, are that we should uh, start uh, the uh, split and load technique over only over the IVC identification as well as nerve fiber at the inter cable uh, region and avoid using electrocautery around the nerve fibers and sub dissection to identify the nerve, loop them, and to uh, follow those nerves to the other nerves. And one important thing dissection of the aorta should never be uh, done before you identify the nerve fiber at the other, other area because it can disturb the uh, nerves. And again, one uh, the oncological principle, margins of resection should never be compromised in an attempt to maintain the ejaculatory function. Uh, Thank you, Mahindra. That was excellent. I'll request uh, Dr. Anand to yeah. take over. Hmm. That was indeed an uh, excellent demonstration and very well captured video, Mahindra. Thank you. Thank you.
am i audible and is my screen visible yes no problem yeah so you know thanks to the organizers for uh, inviting me for this talk here uh, you know coming to the nurse pairing rpnd so if you've done everything after that brilliant video by dr mahendra if you've done a, you know if you've done exactly all the steps that he said this is what you'll land up in you can actually see the you know the ivc you can see the right renal artery you can see the left renal vein and in between you can see all the you know all the nerve fascicles all the nerves going on and as dr mahendra very beautifully said you all that you have to do is identify one nerve and you can go back and forth and one nerve can 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 lead to an anastomosing pattern of of branches as you can see the middle nerve here is actually branched into two so you you catch hold of one nerve and then you go up and down and then you can preserve the nerves what are the results of nerve sparing rpnd we will just very briefly talk about the publication from our institute on nerve sparing post chemotherapy rpnd for uh, nsgct um so the the study peer uh, in the study duration we are uh, 110 patients underwent post chemotherapy rpnd uh, nerve sparing rpnd was achieved in about 33 patients roughly about 30 patients of the pair of of all patients underwent nerve sparing this was slightly lower in high volume centers they say that you know up to 40% now even more can undergo nerve sparing rpnd but uh, that probably just reflected the learning curve at our institute the median follow up duration for all these patients was 75 points uh, you know was was a little over 6 years that is important because we'll talk about oncological outcomes very shortly uh, you know baseline characteristics if you can actually see that you know regarding what dr mahendra had said of these 33 patients 17 were stage 2b 10 were stage 2c and we even did a couple of uh, you know uh, six patients for for stage 3 um, pre op semen analysis as dr jitin had very perfectly said all of them need to have a pre op semen analysis of the 34 uh, 33 four had oligospermia slash azospermia uh, 29 patients had the normal counts so that's why we did the final post op histopathology was necrosis in 21 viable tumor in 3 and teratoma in 9 uh the laterality was 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 just slightly more in right but 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 nothing very significant um i'm so sorry yeah so 19 of uh, 33 patients who have nerve sparing uh, rplnd had anti grade ejaculation preserved so that's about uh, slightly less than 60% anti grade ejaculation if we if we uh, look at the study duration and just divide it half by half like i said you know the learning curve was was significant so anti grade ejaculation was achieved in 47% of the patients who underwent surgery during the first half of the study compared to about 70% of the patients who underwent surgery at the later part of the study uh, you know the reasons being everything that dr mahinder had said don't use diathermy you know meticulous dissection uh, you don't have to buzz everything that bleeds the mean duration of time to anti grade ejaculation from surgery was about 7 months again this is slightly more than what is reported in literature which is about 3 to 4 months and at the end of the study four patients have naturally fathered uh, children until the time of the last follow up the five year dfs was 98% only one patient had a recurrence so this is really the last slide of the of the presentation how do we select patients for post chemotherapy nerve sparing rplnd our selection criteria is that you know this is all based on upfront imaging upfront imaging there should not be disease on the contralateral side all disease should be restricted to the ipsilateral side Uh, of the testicular cancer or the intraaortic cavern but nothing on the opposite side so the size of the tumor should preferably be less than 5 uh, less than or equal to 5 cm uh, and there should be absence of extensive fibrosis or desmoplastic reaction in the retroperitoneum as was alluded to by dr nikol there are a few limitations retrospective nature small sample size selection bias for low volume disease and uh, absence of routine post operative uh, semen analysis this is pretty much conversant uh, consistent with what was also reported in literature again only one paper from india that was available by dr amle said where they looked at post chemotherapy rplnd uh, you know 20% of the patients underwent nerve sparing rplnd and the overall survival was about 75% uh, the five year dfs was about 75% thank you so much thank you both of the presentations have been excellent and i would really Uh, commend the quality of video of Dr. Uh, Mehta. He had actually shown the nerves very beautifully. And although there are no beginners here, but I would just like to point out that for the beginners, they can take the help of senior people who have been doing lumbar sympathectomy for Burgess disease, because these the lumbar chain is very easily identified on the right side of the IVC, and then it goes behind the IVC. So if you begin on right side of the IVC. and then slowly and meticulously dissect as mahendra had shown 
you your success rate is likely to be very good and and dr david nicole also in his uh, comment he has mentioned that even in post chemotherapy setting you can get 75% preservation of ejaculation by nerve uh, sparing so the next talk is by dr sudeep rawal dr sudeep rawal is very well known to everybody he is the chief of uh, uh, urology at rajiv gandhi cancer hospital and he is also the medical superintendent of rajiv gandhi cancer hospital and he has been speaking in this fora on a number of occasions so i invite dr sudeep rawal to make uh, his presentation on robotic rpn thank you amlesh uh, can you see my slides and hear me yes yes you are very well audible and your slides are also well seen okay thanks a lot and uh, it's interesting uh, to see the how the rpln d is evolving in our country even i still remember in 80s when we were doing ms uh, we hardly any people were doing rpln d in this country uh we got robot in 2011 and uh, i think 2011 late 2011 or maybe early 2012 we started doing this surgery uh, my topic is uh, evidence and technique so so if you go see the minimally invasive rpln d laparoscopy rplnd has been around since 1992 since the laparoscopy came and there were but not many reports robotic rplnd first described in 2006 and systemic review recently done in 2019 or 2021 has shown that robotic approach have similar results to the laparoscopic approach and outperforming outperforming open surgery as you know the perioperative parameters which are always better with the minimally invasive surgery uh, indications have been told by dr david already i will not go in details uh, these are like stage 1 and 2 a nsgct the low volume post chemotherapy but with the experience you can go for high volume as you have seen the video from uh, gidel also and we also do in bigger tumor depending on the Uh, desmoplastic reaction and also in seminoma you can use robotic rplnd this is again clinical stage 1 where you know no, no tumor no tumor markers are normal but these are the factors which have been already told by dr david also where you should offer rplnd before chemo and this does have advantage this has also been talked about met teratoma with malignant transformation this somatic type malignant transformation these are the patient who should have primary rplnd otherwise the patient will not respond to chemotherapy uh post chemo residual masses as i have told you there is a reason for not offering rplnd in patients who have uh, a bigger tumor or a small tumor even the reason is desmoplastic reaction that's the that's the that's the most important thing when you, when you are doing this surgery it's not that it can be offered in the big big masses Uh, i i saw that uh, uh, extra peritoneal rplnd i used to do it in a patients who used to have big uh, uh, masses in the retroperitoneum we used to go from left side if it is left side tumor through that bed of eighth rib and then we go will be totally extra peritoneal no surgery these are some reports where primary robotic rplnd has been offered and uh, there are multiple reports rather but the cases are not very high in number except that harris and uh, chenni even dr dogra has has reported one from aims post chemo rplnd has been reported again in in n number of cases we were the maximum in 2017 but we have moved on from 13 to 33 now we have completed 33 post chemo rplnd we hardly do primary rplnd because the patients most of the time they avoid surgery in our country they they will go for chemo rather than having this surgery uh there are other data for robotic rplnd as you can see from germany seven primary and 16 from post chemo they were two center rather than one and then there is another from princess margaret center in canada 18 primary and nine post chemo uh the seminoma i have already told you you can offer in selected patients not always this has been discussed also these are the robotic rplnd's approach you can do transperitoneal this is a more familiar and common approach 
extra peritoneal guinal has shown you this has been described before also in laparoscopy patient can be in supine or lateral flank and one can go for monoblock dissection also in in selected patient the da vinci xi single port xsi any robot can be used uh, we have used xsi and xi uh, we don't have sp in india but then these three robots have been used in our center because we have already si already has gone and x and x, xi we are still having this is the paper on learning curve and they have shown that uh, that uh, by the exploiting the data whatever the they are in the literature that after 44 cases one can reduce the timing of robotic rpl and d2 uh, less than uh, the uh, one hour from the whole of the time not the, that you can finish the surgery in one hour there are definite concern they have been already raised by dr uh, david also uh, about the uh, optimize of uh, optimizing uh, op whether the surgery is de de definitely give the uh, uh, optimal uh, node count i will be discussing that also but here one can say that longer op operating time and cost which can actually be come down with the volume and reduction in the console time is is can occur with the with the, as as you improve upon your uh, experience then surgical remote control can cause a dangerous dangerous uh, vascular injury and there are multiple video which have shown that you can repair the aorta or ivc easily uh, using the robot is we also have one uh, cases where i injured the aorta and could repair it then the oncological outcome that's the most important and uh, they the one can say it's a short duration but if you see the laparoscopy has long term data and there is no reason to believe that robotic will perform inferior and this is the paper which one can say that from kelve he reported that uh, there are unusual pattern of recurrence after robotic RP, rplnd there is one in field and four out of field uh, for this uh, you can say that you see this james potter he he does uh, robotic rplnd a lot and he has uh, uh, already raised the, that this is raises the more question than answer we know that even in upper rplnd there are similar rare frequency of recurrence can occur and everything depends on the skill and experience of the surgeon irrespective of the approach uh, this is the uh, you know our, our docking how you do it for si or x like, like this uh, camera port is here 12 mm assistant then 8 mm 8 mm 8 mm for x you can go in one line and then there is a assistant port this is a small video clip and uh, we did this uh, in a patient who's actually had a bigger mass than 5 cm on actually uh, on on ct scan they said it is 8 cm we did discuss among ourselves but we thought let us dock the robot and see the you can see that not much desmoplastic reaction is there is there but it's not that you can't deal with it sometimes it is pretty bad and this is a very small clip uh, of this patient since the time is less so uh, uh, we already have edited this clip one can do as good as job in as you do in open surgery only thing that in the beginning you may not be concentrating on the nerves that that's this this i have seen in my experience in the beginning i could not do the nerve sparing rplnd but with time uh, we 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 are able to offer these patient the nerve sparing surgery also you can see this is the ibc here there's the aorta there are clips lying in the retroperitoneum the yield of number of the lymph node has been up to 28 in our series one need to clip the uh, lymphatics otherwise you land up in the lymphoria of uh, we uh, had in four patients which uh, i think uh, in the beginning we explored two patient later on we started uh, uh, using uh, the lipodol injection uh, for lymphography which uh, healed now we always clip those well lymphatics and we do not have this problem any more we learned this in hard way this is the periodic
then you can go for retro cable. So key points are that robotic RPLND has evolved to become a well-rotated effective treatment option and can be performed in a single doc setting uh, for a bilateral template dissection. Good thing is that patient discharge on second or third day, which actually cannot happen in open RPLND. It is feasible to employ robotic RPLND both for primary and salvage situation also, but the, we do need randomized trial with the long-term follow-up comparing the oncological outcome of open and robotic. But with the increased experience of the surgeon and volume of the complication rates definitely come down. You need not to really injure the aorta, but if there's a, huge, uh, there's a bad desmoplastic reaction, you be probably better open that patient rather than, rather than uh, just create a problem for yourself. And definitely one can do nourish pairing approach for these patients with an excellent oncological outcome. But you have to select your patient. You cannot offer robotic RPLND in everyone. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Amlesh, I think you're muted. Okay. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sudhir. In fact, we are running short of time. Thanks, Dr. Sudhir. You have done a very good job. Uh, because we are running a little short of time, the chat box has been very, very active. Uh, but I think uh, we'll uh, postpone these chat box questions to the uh, panel discussion time. Uh, so now I would invite uh, Professor Sandy Srinivas, who is a professor of medical oncology at Stanford University. She is uh, trained in New York. So, uh, and... so the yes. next, yeah, the next talk is uh, Dr. Vedang Murthy's. Okay, sorry, I missed that. Okay, Dr. Vedang Murthy. Yes, Dr. Vedang Murthy is going to talk about radiotherapy for testicular cancer. In fact, there have been some questions regarding radiotherapy. So I hope all these questions will be clarified. Dr. Vedang Murthy is a professor of uh, radiation therapy at Tata Memorial Hospital. And he's going to talk about radiotherapy for testicular cancer, current understanding and concerns, both. Dr. Vedang Murthy, please. Thank you, uh, Dr. Amlesh. I think uh, uh, everything is set, I guess forgotten modality, uh, but let's hope that uh, I give some perspective about uh, and some new information about what radiotherapy can do and should do in, semi, uh, in testicular cancers. So I have been asked to talk about the current understanding and concerns. And uh, uh, this slide summarizes the current understanding. Uh, in NSGCTs, there is no definitive role of uh, radiotherapy except in very uh, peculiar or individualized situations. So we'll leave that for the moment. Um, in seminomas, I'm going to talk about stage one, uh, stage two A and B, where it is considered the standard of care. And I'll show you some new data and some very interesting uh, information about the role of radiotherapy that we're talking about post chemotherapy uh, setting that we've just been uh, discussing uh, so much. The current concerns are simple. A radiotherapy comes with a big baggage of second cancers um, uh, that is somehow uh, uh, stuck uh, in a way that uh, it has. That is why the role has diminished. But I'll talk about are these relevant and can we do something about it? There's also a lesser known issue about cardiovascular complications after radiotherapy uh, and the etiology of that is not clear. So for stage one seminoma, uh, it's a well-established paradigm to, to treat with radiotherapy. The idea is to treat the draining lymph nodes in the abdomen and pelvis and follow up the patient. Uh, this uh, achieves a cure of 98-99% of the patients and that should be the end of the story. But that is clearly not the case. So what is the problem? As I said, second cancers. And there's a definite uh, but small and finite risk of second cancers. And to put a whole lot of literature uh, 
of a large uh, population based studies in perspective i think uh, 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 so so this kind of summarizes it for a 35 year old patient who undergoes radiotherapy uh, the 40 year risk so when the patient is 75 the risk of second malignancy uh, particularly solid malignancy is about 33% as compared to 23% if that patient had not undergone uh, radiation. So there is a risk um, and uh, with larger fields and doses. Now, can we do something about it? Uh, in a very nice modeling paper, uh, uh, we can do two things. Uh, the second cancers are related to primary to, to the amount of tissue that is irradiated, that is the uh, field size and the dose. And you can see a very, in, very nice graph here. The bottom, uh, this is patient received radiotherapy at the age of 35. And you can see the bottom dotted line is the normal general population risk of second cancers. If uh, the top is what happens when we treat with a large dog leg field and the bottom middle one is with what we treat with a smaller paraortic field. So that is just to give you a perspective. So what have we done about this? Two things. We've tried to reduce the field size, a large MRC trial of nearly 500 patients compared paraortic and dog leg fields. Dog leg fields were larger fields comparing uh, involving paraortic and pelvic nodes in stage one. And it was found that the outcomes are absolutely similar and there was less toxicity with paraortic radiotherapy. The second thing was to reduce the dose. Another MRC trial uh, almost two decades ago compared 30 gray, which was the standard at that, that time, to 20 gray uh, and over 600 patients. Again, the outcomes were identical and lesser toxicity with 20 gray. So based on this, paraortic radiotherapy has become the standard of care to a dose of 20 gray in two weeks um, in most of the patients with stage one. And these patients are treated generally with uh, standard AP anterior posterior uh, fields. Um, can technology help any further? Uh, IMRT, we talk about IMRT in almost all cancers. Can IMRT help here? Well, well, yes, to some extent, yes. You can see here a standard radiotherapy field. If you want to treat this, you end up treating all this bowel, this pancreas, et cetera, and IMRT can conform the dose to a very small area, so it can help. And again, dosimetric studies have shown that using IMRT, you can reduce the dose to a number of um, uh, organs, particularly bowel, pancreas, stomach, et cetera, and hopefully reduce the chance of malignancy. Uh, can we take technology even further? So I'm talking of protons here. There's a lot of interest about this, although the data is very less. Uh, in theory, protons can help uh, by reducing the dose to the normal tissues. And there are, again, modeling studies that show that uh, using protons in, 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 say, a 35-year-old man can have a uh, significant reduction in second cancers, but this is not something that I, I have either experience with or I'm recommending, uh, but this is uh, the theoretical benefits of proton therapy. For stage two seminoma, uh, 2A, and we'll cover some of this, most of this in the panel, so I'm not going to talk about this. Uh, 2A radiotherapy is the standard. 2B, um, uh, I would believe a lot of patients would benefit with radiotherapy as well. Um, and we treat with a standard dog leg field. Uh, there is no paraortic here. It's always going to be dog leg field to a dose of 30 gray and a small six gray boost to the residual node or rather the, the original node. Uh, I'd also like to touch upon very briefly a very interesting concept that we have started talking about. This was uh, something that we wrote uh, recently how to deal with a post-chemotherapy mass and is this uh, the time to reevaluate the role of radiotherapy with my former uh, boss and colleague uh, at the Royal Marsden. So this is a classic uh, stage two, stage three seminoma, advanced disease, we've all seen them. This happens after chemotherapy. 
when we do a PET scan, you can see something light, lighting up with a, a SUV of six or eight or whatever. Uh, the options, this is where the options start becoming very difficult to choose. We don't know what to do. Um, we, um, we can observe, as Dr. David Nicole said, to up to six months, but that requires repeated PET scans, repeated visits, anxiety, surgery. We know more than anything else is quite difficult. Chemotherapy is toxic. So can radiotherapy make a difference here? And uh, the question is, can radiotherapy uh, be used in such a scenario? We published a very uh, small but very interesting study recently in, uh, in clinical oncology. There were 69 patients uh, post-chemotherapy, uh, post-standard BEP and seminoma. 48 were observed and 21 received radiotherapy at different times. We divided them, all of them had a PET scan. We divided them by their SUV and size and found that uh, those who have a large SUV more than three and a size uh, more than three centimeter benefit significantly in disease-free survival uh, with radiation rather than observation. Almost 30, 40% of them would relapse. And based on this information, we are now uh, proposing a, a randomized trial uh, that we are talking to people with and we are in touch with uh, several centers. Uh, this essentially randomizes patients post chemotherapy uh, into observation or radiation if they have a, a pet positivity. And if you, any of you are interested, please get in touch. We are going to make it multicentric, and we are also integrating the miRNA into this as a prognostic and predictive marker. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vedant. Uh, uh, you have. Uh discuss these issues very, very precisely. And I'm sure you will uh, be there for the panel discussion and there will be lots of questions that will be asked. And now I make Professor Sandy Srinivas from uh, the uh, University of Calix from Stanford University. No, you want... Uh, no, sir, I, I think uh, maybe there's a... So we have Dr. Uh, Ganesh Pakshi's talk. Uh, Professor uh, yeah, uh, Ganesh Pakshi, uh, yeah, he heads the Urooncology Division yeah. at Tata Memorial Center. And uh, he that has a talk on survivorship. Sorry. And following that, we have uh, Dr. Sandy Shrivas. I know we are okay. all waiting and very eagerly waiting for Dr. Sandy Shrivas' talk. But, no, no, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I yeah, think yeah. there has been some problem in the printout that I have got. I think uh, I missed these. Sorry. So, welcome Dr. Ganesh Bakshi, who is Chief of uh, Urooncology at Tata Memorial Hospital. Thank you, sir. Uh, survivors, so, survivorship issues. Testicular yes. cancer, survivorship issues. Uh, I, I can... Uh, People can hear, right? Uh, so yes, the burden people of disease can hear goes and this way. Yes, sir. The burden of disease, it's about 1% of the newly diagnosed cancer worldwide and the age group is pretty low. So there is exceptional sensitivity to available treatments and the OS goes very high, rendering the majority of these men as testicular germ cell tumor survivors. Though... As uh, my previous speaker was also saying, uh, late adverse effects and quality of life issues may remain. So uh, why testicular cancer? Because uh, these survivors are young. They are with usually minimal comorbidities. The average lifespan of treatment is after treatment is long. And we have a long follow-up time and the possibility to expand our knowledge about this survivorship. So... Uh, some of them are potentially life-threatening, like uh, Dr. Vedang, my colleague, mentioned second malignant neoplasms. The carcinogenic effect from radiotherapy and chemotherapy for uh, testicular germ cell uh, tumors can happen. And there have been very large studies uh, which show two-fold increased risk after chemo radiotherapy and a three-fold increased risk after both modalities. So SMNs after chemo, primarily they are recorded are pharynx, esophagus, lung, bladder, and leukemias. And after radiation, also pharynx, stomach, liver, pancreas, bladder. And there might be some rare ones here, there. But uh, these are a few publications. This is from 2013, solid tumors after chemotherapy or surgery. Now, this was a large CR-based study, and which did show that the SIR of 0.93 for solid tumors uh, versus SIR of... Uh, 1.43 with chemo. So risk of SMNs is not increased with patients on surveillance vis-a-vis -vis the chemotherapy. 
if you see the radiotherapy for stage 1 and 2 testicular seminomas the secondary malignancies and survival this was published in 2017 so uh, a large number 9000 plus uh, uh, 7337 uh, observed so there is increased relative risk of smns 1.84 with radiation so many other studies have also found increased risk of the radiation and uh, this paper in 2016 second malignant neoplasms and cause of death a danish study so cisplatin based chemotherapy was associated with cancer of small intestine lung kidney bladder and malignant melanoma and the risk of for smn and death due to smn were increased after bp alone rt alone or even more than one line of therapies uh, thus to summarize these uh, chemotherapy and treatment related side effects the steady reduction in radiation dose and the field size as uh, dr vedang mentioned might reduce the risk of smns to a certain extent small study compared proton and photon beam therapy treatment plans and modeling of smn risk proton beam therapy provided a favorable dose distribution but no further data is currently available and the increased risk of smns after bp might be due to direct toxic effect of chemotherapy residual teratomas after chemotherapy which over time can transform into various somatic malignancies and increased risk of smns might also be uh, other factors which contribute would be unhealthy lifestyles in uh, adopted by these patients in future so uh, second is disease cvd might pose a threat long term survival of uh, testicular cancer survivors as previous studies have indicated highly increased risks of this life threatening late effect especially after treatment with platinum containing chemotherapy so the risk of cvd and cvd related mortality after orchiectomy in patients with clinical stage 1 disease has been shown to be equivalent to that of general population uh, cvd with chemotherapy so there are four studies which identified the risk increased risk of uh, venous thromboembolism during treatment with bp and i guess in clinical practice we do see this often a norwegian study found almost six fold increase risk with a hr of 5.7 of coronary artery disease in a study of 161 patients treated with bp versus uh, three, 306 who received only surgery and this danish study with 1800 patients treated with bp had increased risk of myocardial infarction cv and vt during the first year by one year after bp the risk had decreased to the general level population but after 10 years also the patients did experience increase in risk of mi and cv related events so uh, cv with adjuvant rt now this is debated there are large studies which indicate minimal risk and no excess cvd related mortality was identified after adjuvant radiotherapy in a very large study of 7000 plus patient using sear data the summary of this particular disease cvd goes survivor should be advised to adopt a healthy lifestyle and identifying uh, cardiovascular risk factors in them is important an effective intervention to reduce the risk of cvd and pgct could be smoking cessation increased risk of hypertension hypercholesterolemia has also been associated with bp so preventive measures for that and monitoring of blood pressure level at every follow up uh, visit and monitoring of blood lipids every 2 years might be appropriate many of us don't factor that into the protocols so next uh, issue is the impairment of single organ function this is very well known neurotoxicity and ototoxicity published uh, this a particular paper i'm showing is 2017 and both are adverse reactions related to cisplatin therapy cisplatin induced peripheral neuropathy uh, 20 to 30% of patients at 5 10 years after treatment cipn was associated with cumulative cisplatin dose age smoking habits excess drinking and uh, also with association of rpr di1b gene in conclusion cumulative cisplatin dose remains the single most uh, important modifiable factor for this about pulmonary toxicity also a known factor with glio treatment with bp can induce acute pulmonary toxicity due to bilio and with a pool probability of 11.7% compared with 1.7% of treatment without bilio in a meta analysis so it is still said that after 5 years of follow up if there is no gross fibrosis pulmonary impairment in bp treated uh, patients was limited and overall pulmonary function did return to a good level uh, about nephrotoxicity as a organ dysfunction 
there have been large studies which uh, bp treated patients identified a dose dependent decrease in renal function at the end of treatment the study did include repeated radioisotopically measured gfr and found a significant improvement in the follow up at 1 3 5 years after treatment and almost a 90 95% uh, function to return uh, at one year however the risk of developing ckd stage 3 still remained at 12 to 23% which is also quite high hormonal disturbances ledig cell dysfunction uh, defined as elevated le levels of lh or uh, with or without corresponding low testosterone can be seen after any treatment modality but the risk is much higher after radiotherapy and chemotherapy than after orchiectomy alone hypogonadism may lead to a lot of uh, problems in sexual functioning and well being fertility problems muscle weakness loss of energy depression and it also increases osteoporosis and associated metabolic syndromes uh, testosterone substitution should be initiated in patients with persistently low testosterone levels a high prevalence of hypogonadism in this particularly cohort uh, tells us the importance of prolonged follow up of tcas uh, survivors including assessment of risk factors of cvd metabolic syndrome lifestyle factors and hypogonadism so about uh, sexual dysfunction in survivors can occur because of psychological and physical adverse effects the prevalence of ed regardless of treatment modality has been reported to be 8 to 19% after a long follow up orgasmic dysfunction was increased in these survivors irrespective of uh, treatment uh, arms and association between post chemotherapy activities and orgasmic dysfunction is actually well known to us uh, fathering children is important to many of these survivors reduced fertility can follow treatment or be a part of testicular dysgenesis syndrome which also includes cryptorchidism and hypospadias before chemotherapy 66 to 91% of patients with uh, testicular tumor succeeded in fathering child whereas only 43 to 71% did succeed later and fertility is further reduced by treatment with combined modalities and high doses of cisplatin uh, late psycho social effects proportion of survivors are in the adolescent young adult aya population this age span is unique challenging period of psychosocial development in which the young person has to navigate through many challenges associated with young age and uh, such as identity education employment body image and family relationships so many survivors do not experience substantial psychological morbidity but some variety of long term conditions causing psychological distress like anxiety fear of recurrence cancer fatigue and uh, cognitive dysfunction the prevalence of this clinically significant depression is also about 5 to 12% uh these all factors actually add to the these are the stressors the somatic stressors and the socio economic stressors uh, stressors actually so uh, long term cognitive function in testicular germ cell tumor survivors uh, it was observed that there was a significant decline in the gct survivor reported long term cogf uh, most significant changes to cognition could be attributed to radiotherapy and chemo with radiotherapy causal relations of cogf and radiotherapy to retrobrittle nodes is still not clear and remains to be explored uh, this actually figure summarizes the topic there are psychosocial issues pulmonary toxicity a big uh, smn chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy ototoxicity cardiovascular disease nephrotoxicity and hypogonadism thank you so we have all have seen that uh, the cure rates are excellent after testicular cancer but there are so many other issues and all these issues need to be addressed and now the emphasis after high cure rates is on actually reducing the morbidity of the treatment and that is uh, that has been brought out very well by ganesh as well as by vedang vedang also talked about the same issue and ganesh has uh, talked about multiple issues and i think dr sandy shrinivas may also talk about a few of these issues in her talk dr sandy shrinivas please okay um thank you so much for the invite you know gagans wanted me to talk a little bit about treatment selection can you guys hear me 
Yeah, yes. we can. Okay, perfect. So this sort of summarizes the all of the presentations, I think, that we have heard from the morning about the role of really this multimodal therapy. So I'm going to start off very briefly just touching upon how do we select appropriate therapy for the right patient, and it really comes down to staging. A few words about staging for testicular cancer, which I find very unique in that there are only three stages, unlike most cancers, which go to four. Testicular cancer is stage one, two, and three. And the second thing is that serologic markers are so integrated into the staging. And I think about... Um, uh, different levels. So S1 really is the most important thing to remember, where you have uh, AFP less than 1,000, HCG less than 5,000, and LDH less than 1.5. At least in advanced cancer, we treat um, good risk different from intermediate and poor risk. So I just remember one out of these three. Moving on. Um, so how do we select? I put two different columns for you. So seminoma and non-seminoma. If you look at stage one, that as we have heard from the speakers this morning, you know, for stage one, we have the option of surveillance, radiation, or use of chemotherapy. And I think it really comes down to compliance. Will patients be compliant if they were to choose surveillance? In the US and in other countries, insurance paying for the cost of scan is an issue. Patients worry about fertility and risk of a second malignancy. And I think there's a lot of patient anxiety that also goes into consideration for which one you would choose. For stage two, seminoma, it really comes down between chemotherapy and radiation for uh, early stages, as Dr. Vedang mentioned. And here, too, I think the criteria is about the concern for second malignancy. And finally, for stage three patients with seminoma, thing to point out that seminoma, there is no poor risk. There's only good risk and intermediate risk. And the choices are between uh, PB times three for good risk versus uh, eliminating bleomycin and doing four cycles. And for intermediate risk, it would be PB times four versus VIP times four. How do we pick between these? Really, it comes down to patient's age, renal function, whether they have extensive um, disease that will require surgery and exposure to anesthesia. Now, for non-seminoma, for stage one, again, there are three choices, surveillance, RPLND, versus uh, giving one round of chemotherapy. And I think the selection criteria are very similar uh, in terms of seminoma. For patients with stage two, here, unlike uh, in seminomas, there is no role for radiation, and the choice is between RPLND versus chemotherapy. And for advanced disease, here you have good, intermediate, and poor risk, and these are the three choices of chemotherapy. Now, I wanted to talk briefly about chemotherapy toxicity, where uh, the issue with bleomycin really has to do with pulmonary fibrosis, which is what makes a lot of people choose PE times four versus giving PEB. And my selection between VIP versus BEP would be if patients are going to need post-chemo RPLND, I'd like to avoid bleomycin in those patients. Unfortunately, neuropathy is a big issue, as we just heard from the uh, last speaker. And neuropathy can happen with many of the chemotherapy drugs that we use in germ cell, cisplatinum, paclitaxel, iphosphamide, all of these regimens are associated with neuropathy. I'm going to go now to the IGCCG risk assessment. This is really bread and butter of what we do for patients. The minute they have stage two or stage three, you have to bring in this risk assessment. And this was originally published in 1997 and really takes into divide seminoma and non-seminoma. And it takes three things into consideration, gonadal or extragonadal primary, whether patients have non-pulmonary visceral metastasis and the height of tumor markers. And you can see how they spread out between the two columns. 
For seminoma, there is LDH has not been taken into consideration, and we'll talk a little bit about the update. Now, to almost two and a half decades later, the IGCCG put together an update. And the goal of this update was really to see if the original one is still holding true and to sort of look at more granular features. So here is the updated IGCCG for non-seminoma. And the first column is the original publication in 1997, which looks at both PFS and OS for the three groups. And the column to your right looks at the new one in 2020. And the bottom line message here is that the validation holds, still holds true, number one. Number two, you can see improvements in overall survival in each group, but the group that's really made a big change is the poor risk group. You can see that the PFS has gone from 41% to 54, and the OS has almost increased by 20% from 48 to 67%. Probably some of the things that we have spoken today all hold true, multidisciplinary approach, using uh, cisplatinum-based chemotherapy, using post-chemotherapy rpl &D more appropriately, having high uh, centers of excellence, and uh, following guidelines all probably have contributed to this improvement in survival. This is the next slide shows you the updated one for seminoma. Here too, you can see that with the update from 30 institutions from North America, Australia, and Europe, um, there is consistent improvement in overall survival for intermediate risk from 72% to 88%. So definitely have made progress in the last 25 years with uh, testicular cancer becoming uh, one of the most durable cancers. One thing that's interesting in this new update that was seen is LDH. So as I said, LDH has not been part of the IGCCG, but if you look at a patient here, the first curve is a good risk patient, and the one in red is a good risk patient with an elevated LDH, and that patient's outcome almost looks the same as an intermediate risk patient. So this is an LDH greater than 2.5. So certainly it is prognostic. Moving forward, I will be looking very closely at LDH in patients with uh, good risk. And I don't think, I mean, as a purist, we are not going to make treatment recommendations based on this, but definitely it appears that LDH may be able to separate the good risk patients a little bit better. I wanted to finally share with you that there is an, um, an uh, calculator that you can use. So briefly, the top one up here looks at a patient who's 28, who has no visceral uh, metastasis and has elevated markers and his three-year PFS would be around 93%. That same patient, if you now add um, lung metastasis, it drops down to about 89%, so still good, but the presence of lung metastasis also appears to have some uh, difference in uh, prognosis. The one at the bottom is the same patient now who is a little bit older. You can see that as he goes from 28 to let's say 40 years, that drops down to 85%. So this new update definitely gives us a little bit more granularity. So what are our gaps in our current treatment selection? So for patients with stage one, there's definitely over-treatment in a majority. For patients with stage two, I think the issue of should we choose radiotherapy versus chemotherapy? And finally, for that post-chemo RPLND patient, does everyone need it? And 
the hope is that we may, Dr. Vedang briefly mentioned about microRNA 371. What is it? it these are small non-coding RNA regulating oncogenes and tumor suppression genes. And really, I think there have been multiple very well done studies showing that it is highly specific, has good sensitivity, it's easily available, it's a blood test, it's reproducible and may come with a cost. But some of the downsides are there's still not complete agreement about the methodology. It's a, there's no fully agreed cutoff about what is normal. And there's still microRNA 371 um, may not be perfect for teratoma. There is a microRNA 375. So perhaps combining these two in the future may allow us a little bit better selection. So there are two prospective studies looking at microRNA. So my hope is that maybe microRNA would be really helpful in stage one patients where only if they are microRNA positive would we consider offering them some therapy. And then in the post-chemo patient, I think a negative 371 will exclude viable disease, but it still cannot exclude a teratoma. So again, you know, we may need a combination with 375 to use it in the future. So I think I'll stop with that and looking forward to the panel discussion to address some of these questions as well. Thank you, Dr. Srinivas. You have uh, done a wonderful job and you have appraised us of the small nuances and what is the latest thinking on IGCC. Are you a part of the IGCC C group or? Uh, yes. You, have, mm -hmm. you are. So we are lucky to have uh, directly from the horse's mouth. Thank you very much. And now we look forward to the panel discussion. I hand over to the organizers. Thank you. So uh, we would invite Dr. Sanjay Adla. He's uh, already here with his slides. And I have uh, to request him to uh, maybe try and reduce the length of his panel uh, as you're running late and uh, we we have our Good esteemed uh, panelists yeah, whom uh, Dr. Sanjay would be inviting. Yeah. Hi, yeah. Sanjay. Okay. Good evening. I'll try to do it in 30, max 35 minutes. Okay. So when we started devising the panel about a month ago, I asked for medical oncologists. So they gave me the best medical oncologist managing testicular cancer in India in the form of Dr. Amit Joshi and the best in America, Sandy Srin was. I couldn't have asked for more. Then nobody ever will know more about radiation oncology than Vedang Murthy, so I got that. And they said, you need somebody with equipoise and knowledge in India. So I got Makran Kochikar, sir, and the phantom head with respect to the euro-oncological knowledge from Royal Marsden, so Professor Nikal. So I've got all the people I wanted. Let's see how I can make use of them to understand or try to clear my own doubts. When I was started design, de devising the questions, I wanted to know whom I'm trying to enlighten or try to give some knowledge. There are quite a few urology and oncology trainees. And I felt other than the first talk, we haven't addressed their needs. So that's what I'm, I'm going to try. There are quite a few co-urologists and then we have got the subspecialist. I might be asking the same question to more than one panel member. It doesn't mean that I'm not happy with that, but there is a difference in opinion across the Atlantic and that's what I want to know. And if there is any point to be elucidated with evidence, if you can quote any reference, I think it would be useful. Personal bias, I've spent 19 years working in Christie Hospital and in North of England. So I do tend to like EAU guidelines and nice practice. Okay, so I'll start off with this one. This has been elucidated in the first talk, 28 year old gentleman coming in with a right-sided testicular discomfort and ultrasound scan shows this. And this is a very common occurrence that we tend to have. I know Jitin has mentioned it, but I just wanted to clarify. Uh, Makaran sir, what yeah. do you use as a definition? Do we have an agreement or something that you can guide us with? I think there is an agreement with the radiologists and the evidence of the literature also suggests 
that the microcalcification typically described as a snowstorm appearance or something like you know, a starry appearance in the testes itself. Now, there is an agreement universally that if you see more than four to six set of microcalcifications within the testes, um, especially- Can I just it is, ask, is it, is it in the testicle or is it in one area of a scan? In the testicle, not in the in one the area. Of okay. It's like typically the case what you've shown. Okay. So if you see that much amount of calcification, the number usually varies between four to six. And if it is a small volume testes, I have a very strong suspicion of malignancy in this case. Okay. There are so, studies in America, there are studies uh, done in sort of, you know, arm forces, routine yes. screening, found that it is very common. It's not that uncommon. Yes. You get yes. alarm when you see a small volume testes and the number is more than six. The second oh. point I would like to make here is there is a lens coding system that we, our department has been practicing and that we have followed right from UK time. And the lens scoring system was published way back in 1993. And the scoring system usually starts from one, two, three, four, saying there's a regular, slightly irregular, moderately irregular sort of a calcification. And the score more than sort of six usually suggests, score more than four usually suggests that there is strong suspicion of malignancy. I'm going to ask this clear question that a patient asked me. Does this suggest that cancer may be present? What I mean is, do we need to look harder whenever there is microlithiasis that there might be cancer? Professor Nicol. Um, I guess just to preface my answer, it needs to be stressed that the sort of prevalence of cancer does vary in societies um, in one thing and also the threshold at which it's reported. Certainly in our practice in the UK, if someone has a normal test, it's an impalpable mass, or no, no palpable mass, we would discharge the patient irrespective of the count. The more difficult patient is the one who's had cryptorchidism um, and an atrophic testicles. They have to have both of those present and microlithiasis. They'd be someone that you'd probably keep a sort of a soft eye on and suggest an ultrasound in a year or two rather than discharge completely. So that, that would be how I would, would, would view so it. So you would divide them into low risk and high risk. Low risk would be normal testicle. You would just say self-examine. Higher risk would be a subfertile small testicle history of undescended testicle or a contralateral tumor. I, I guess, but often that's like in the context of someone who's been sent to see me who's yes. anxious about it. And so they often like it for reassurance that you haven't just sort of dismissed them entirely. And well, I think the interval of two years is probably very reasonable because there's no obvious tumor present. They're aware of the situation. Obviously, you conduct self-examination. Okay, so at the end of two years, you would say that as there hasn't been any change. In case if there is any increase in the calcification? Uh, I'm not aware of a case where it has actually increased. I, I, okay. I think it's non-progressive, but could be wrong. Okay, thank you. And just in this one, is microlithiasis pre uh, precancerous? Yes or no? No. Okay, thank you very much. So the, going on to this next one, a 30-year-old male, history of orchidopexy on the left, palpable lump in the right hemiscrotum. Okay, so orchidopexy on the left and the palpable lump in the right hemiscrotum. Ultrasound scan shows that the testicle is 11 millimeters in volume. And I just wanted to ask, if orchidopexy is done on one side, one side is abnormal, why there is an increased risk of testicular cancer in the other testicle? Dr. Srinivas and the Prof. Srinivas. And the second is, is undescended an anatomical problem, a hormonal problem, or there is something problem, biological problem that they are just both testicular equally prone for testicular cancer? You know, I tell my patients that once you, with paired organs, right, there's always an issue, whatever that caused them to have it in that one side, puts them at risk. We know bilateral tumors are about one to 2%. So certainly this patient, uh, just by virtue of having one uh, primary, there's a six fold increase in the opposite side. So I think he is at risk. Um, why one has an undescended testicle, I'm not sure whether we fully understand about these differences. And certainly, uh, we, but we do know that even a testicle that's brought down, it doesn't decrease their risk of malignancy. I mean, it improves their fertility, but they remain at risk. 
Thank you. So we went on to do the tumor markers. They were just marginally elevated. Chest, abdomen, and pelvis was clear. And we plan to do an orchidectomy. I just wanted clarification. Is this uh, Makaran, sir? It says andrological assessment. This is according to the NCCN guidelines. Do you do that in all patients? Yeah, I mean, andrological assessment, I believe, would be talking about the hormone profile in this guy. Yes. And everything. And also, probably, it would also encompass the semen preservation or cryo preservation. That's that one is the second because they have mentioned that separately. And in this one, they have looked at the testosterone levels and okay. semen quality. Yeah, the testosterone levels are important. FSH and LH levels are also important. There is enough evidence to suggest that if you have persistently high level of FSH post archaeotomy, these patients are at a high risk of developing a tumor in the opposite testis. And just briefly mention, you asked Sandy about, you know, what's the problem in these patients for, you know, have one descendant testis on the other side. They have testicular degenesis syndrome. They are genetically bad testis. So if you have an FSH assessment done prior to surgery, then you know what's the baseline value. And the higher levels persistent post-op would suggest that these patients probably have infertility, high chance, and also probably a tumor on the opposite testis. Also, I haven't done... Uh, yeah, uh, testosterone assessments before. So that's a new addition. Then the second is testicular processes. Do you, yeah, when yeah. do you put them and do you always offer it to patients? Yeah, in the UK, we used to do it immediately at the time of surgery. There's no problem. In India, we give a choice to the patients. Most of the patients from poor economic strata may not be able to afford it. Now, I don't see any reason to do it at a later stage also, but you're gone in, you know the diagnosis and much more easier to put it at the same time. So you would do it at the time of doing the architecture? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Uh, sperm bank, Amit. Dr. Amit Joshi, is he around? Yes. Yes, Sanjay. Okay. Uh, do you, when do you do it and why would you do it? As in, if you were doing it at a certain uh, time point, when would you do it and why would you do it? So the ideal time is to, uh, before going for a to me, but in a what situation, most of the time, we end up uh, um, when the patient had undergone architectomy and came us for starting the treatment chemotherapy. Then we discuss. So I think in majority of our say around eighty percent patient, it's post architectomy. So ideally, it should be done pre architectomy. So whatever the uh, uh, um, if there is any volume of uh, semen available in that test, that can also be um, um, free, frozen for for future use. Okay. Thank you. So you would like to do it before the orchidectomy because there is a decrease in the volume as well as the quality of the sperm following the orchidectomy. Yes. But generally it tends, tends to end up after the orchidectomy before the second line of treatment. Contralateral yes. testicular biopsy, Prof. Uh, when, why, and how? I mainly want to ask you how. Yes. How would you do? Because there is a variation in the way I used to do them in Christie and what I have read. Whenever you had to do it, how would you do a testicular biopsy? Um, I, I do it on a small subset of patients, I must admit, and yes. I'd normally use a scrotal incision, just take a sample from the upper and lower poles because it can be unevenly distributed in the testis. Okay. I guess the rationale is that if you're doing it, you're doing it to do radiotherapy, and so the whole argument with the lymph channels diminishes and it's less morbid than an inguinal approach. Okay, so you would, and you don't do a true cut. You tend to make an incision through, yeah. uh, open the tunica albuginia and then take a piece of tissue. Yeah, I guess that's sort of more my anxiety about uh, hematoma in what will be a solitary testicle. Okay, but even you were, if you were doing a true cut, you're fine with doing a true cut or you don't think the quality no, no, of- No, 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 I, I, I don't have the confidence in it, me doing it. I'd be worried about getting a hematoma in a solitary testicle. So okay. I, sir. Yeah, in UK, we used to do something uh, at the time. Uh, it was very popular in the urology. When you're doing orchiectomy in the inguinal incision, you just make a tunnel on the opposite side and deliver the contralateral testes on that side and try and do sort of, you know, whatever you want to do a biopsy. You do sort of an FNAC or you take a biopsy. And then again, the whole concept of scrotal violation would, would, would not come. So it was just. But do you, do, this, do you do the same whenever you need it here? Yeah, I do. I do. Because in Christie, we made a small skin cut in the scrotum and then just did a true cut biopsy. And we did about in upper pole and lower pole and that was it. 
and as as uh, prof nicola said the reason why you are not that very much worried is you are only trying to diagnose and treat it with radiotherapy so that's why the field would not so can i just make a statement saying that doing a scrotal approach for doing a biopsy on a normal testicle where you are trying to rule out the old style itgci is an acceptable practice but as makran sir has said when you are doing an orchidectomy if you can access the other testicle through the same incision that seems to be more oncologically following principles agree with that prof i will i'll try that's my next case <laughs> thank you and just asking as to when you would do it whenever there is an uh, atrophic testicle previous history of cryptorchidism microlithiasis and a patient less than 40 anything else you would like to add to this not no not no that would be the extent of it really okay uh, is uh, gcnis uh, vedang is it pre cancer or, or is it a cancer well i would call it pre cancer okay. and uh, and the management i think that's your next question isn't it yes sir. So for a for a solitary uh, testis single testis uh, with uh, uh, germ cell neoplasia in situ Uh, the radiotherapy is the treatment of choice in brief uh, the the dose to be given is about 20 gray in 2 gray fractions that is 10 fractions uh, the reason for that is with that dose about uh, there's only about a 1 to 2% chance of uh, recurrence whereas uh, there's a randomized trial that looked at a lower dose of 14 gray and there was about 7 to 10% chance of a recurrence with that so although the uh, the 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 hypogonadism was uh, lesser with the lower dose so that is a balance that one has to strike and your standard fractionation yes two gray fraction yes two gray fraction i just wanted to ask sorry it's not there in this what is the amount of androgen deficiency they tend to develop that's one and the, they are infertile i'm uh, expecting those two So yes, certainly sperm banking, if the semen is normal, has to be done clearly. Uh, and there's about a twenty percent chance that uh, there would be hypogonadism. Twenty percent chance. Okay. And With just that for clarification, yeah. So GCNS, though you said it's precancerous, but almost all these patients will end up being a cancer if you don't treat them. A fifty to seventy-five percent will develop cancer. Will yes. okay. I just I picked up on this sentence that uh, was used in the initial talk. Treating GCNS does not improve survival. Professor Srinivas, scientist Srinivas, the is can you just elucidate on or uh, expand on it? And I am not sure about the statement. I think you know the rarity of these are just so hard to make a study that has an impact on survival. You know, we know that these will develop. into tumors and has to be treated i don't know if there's been great trials really to demonstrate uh, about the survival issue okay so you would not agree with that you know that they are going to develop a cancer so you might as well treat with treat it thank you correct okay so then we have done patient comes for the orchidectomy he has a twin brother what counseling and what imaging I mean, I think counseling he uh, twin studies he is at risk, but I don't know whether there should be any imaging throughout for the uh, in our history of germ cell. I think self exams is probably the best, and uh, there's not been really an uh, ultrasound or some uh, radiologic imaging that's recommended as far as I know. So whether it's the twin brother or the elder brother who's also at risk, I mean there is a higher uh, increase incidence. But other than self exam, I'm I do, we don't routinely recommend any imaging. Okay, and that would be lifelong self examination. That's correct. Okay, and would his son be at an increased risk as well? He has got a seven-year-old son. I don't think so. Unless you tell me something different, I don't think a seven-year-old is at risk. Yes. So, uh, as in, he has got an increased risk. So, her brothers have eight-fold increase, and sons have a four-fold increase risk of testicular cancer. So that's the reason. So, I just wanted to highlight this and say: Is there anything that we don't tend to? I normally did not think that much about family, family history, and informing the family about increased risk. 
But since I, 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 I had given this talk about increased risk, I, I always mention that. Anything that we need to emphasize on this, Vedang? That we don't tend to? Because all of us know about cryptorchidism and we keep on going on about it. But there is an eightfold increased risk with brothers and we don't tend to think that much about it. Vedam? I mean, I'm not uh, sure. Uh... Okay. Sanjay, in day-to-day -day practice, I think uh, uh, Dr. Srinivas can also go and uh, I think we have seen so many papers, but the family history of a testicular cancer, at least uh, I have not come across, um, I don't remember uh, one or two, even I'm, I'm not very sure uh, that the family history uh, of a testicular cancer we see in a day-to-day -day practice uh, working in testicular cancer for last eight to ten years. Dr. Srinivas, have you encountered any such sort, sort of a which, um, uh, at least I have not seen? I agree with you. I think, you know, I can count with the palm of my hand the number of patients who have had uh, brothers or kids. That's why yes. I wasn't even aware of children. But I suppose if you look hard enough, you will find literature on any of this. Yes, it's, it's more of, uh, I, as I said, I wasn't aware of it. And testicular cancer being such a rare cancer, we can't put two and two together unless they were doing population studies. So that's the reason I just wanted to highlight that point. So cryptorchidism and cancer, I just wanted, because norm, it tends to, we tend to have a much higher uh, preponderance of testicular cancer association with uh, cryptorchidism in India. The problem, the most probable reason is that these children are not screened. We don't seem to have the testicular examination screening when the child is born. Is that the reason or anything else, sir? Makran, yeah, I think that's that you're right. Uh, uh, in the Western world, most of the patients would get their testes fixed because they are screened by the pediatricians and neonatologists right from the birth. And if they are diagnosed to have undescended testes, they would get orchidopexy done now less than nine months or six months' time. While in India, even instead of a no educated population, people still believe, and the family physicians still believe, that you have to wait for some time till it comes down. And that's the reason, till today, we see a lot many patients coming in the clinic with undescended testes quite late. And that probably translates into developing testicular tumors in undescended testes. Just briefly, so, uh, the last, uh, last, last point, Sanjay, just very briefly. I think we do see patients. I mean, last week only I had a patient whose brother had a testicular cancer. His son subsequently developed an undescended testes tumor later on. So it's not that uncommon that we need to be really sort of knowing about it and then they take it further to the patients. Thank you. So, and I just wanted, so you, if I make a statement saying that any undescended testicle, the earlier we fix it, the better for the testicular function. And it does decrease the risk of, it doesn't decrease it completely, but it does decrease the longer you take for it to be fixed, the higher the probability of developing a testicular cancer. I'm talking in front of, front of two profs. Am I right in saying that statement, sir? Makran, sir? I, yeah, I, I, I think you're right. Only thing yeah. is the bringing test is down makes it much more easier to do easier to examine yes yeah. and I, I whenever i studied i used to uh, in uh, when we looked at the western literature whenever a testicle is still undescended and as a tumor there is a higher probability of it being a seminoma whereas if you bring it down there is a higher probability of it being an nsgct whereas in india the studies that have been published said that there is an equal proportion of sgct and nsgct why do you what what do you think is happening here prof prof Nikol? Why do they change the way they, uh, the presentation, as in changing from a seminomatous to the non seminomatous if you have brought it down? Um, I, I honestly don't know. Oh. It's, it's just 70% uh, uh, of the ones that are uh, cancer in a crypto orchid testis are seminomas. Yeah. Whereas yes, they tend to be around. Yes. I, I, don't, I didn't know the answer, so I thought you uh, might show. I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> So this is the third one. This was a real one, a, a Manchester medical student who came with acute loin pain and abdominal mass. About a month ago, a young patient having a DVT, but they just treated him for DVT. Nobody bothered to ask the question, why did he have DVT? So what happens a month later, he comes up with abdominal pain. And this is what a CT chest abdomen and pelvis shows this. And this is what it shows. And these are the tumor markers. I just make a quick comment about the DVT yes. yeah. and uh, thromboprophylaxis that patients who are on cisplatinum-based chemotherapy actually have about a 15% incidence of some sort of thrombotic event. It can be line-related or 
um, oleofemoral cavel. And so our standard protocol is to actually put all patients that are having cisplatinum-based uh, chemotherapy and any significant abdominal mass, they all go onto, onto tenzaparin immediately unless there's specific contraindications. For example, a very high HCG or cerebral disease. For how long? Uh, through, until they, we, we keep them on it throughout chemotherapy and carry it on until they've completed their surgery. The reason is if they get a caval thrombosis or oleofemoral thrombosis, surgery becomes terrifying because they then develop this collateral circulation that involves the skin and also retroperitoneum. But it's just a, a really big thing to be aware of that they must go into thromboprophylaxis. I don't know what other centers do, but certainly we are very rigorous um, and, and have a strict protocol on that. I mean, it doesn't Amit, have to be tins of power, but, but we use tins of power. Amit, can, can you add to that? Do we do the same? Dr. Joshi? Please. Yes, so I think in this scenario, what uh, whatever we have experienced... No, no, that, that wasn't the question. Do we give uh, uh, tinziparin for all the patients who are on cisplatin chemotherapy or a large retroperitoneal mass? We do, okay. Uh, uh, Sandy Srinivas, ma'am. So when do you decide on giving a bi getting a biopsy in primary chemo compared to doing the standard of primary orchidectomy and go doing the normal way? And I think for this patient, you already know that he's got stage three disease. He's got an elevated AFP. So by that definition, it is a non-seminoma. It's a huge mass. I think we would want to know what the renal function is. I think one of the issues here is that the patient, if we don't act soon, he may soon have hydro and have a compromised renal function. While ideal would be to get some pathologic tissue, I think getting a bio Biopsy, perhaps we would do a biopsy just because people are so picky about getting pathologic diagnosis. But I think a um, brief FNA of the retroperitoneal mass followed by chemotherapy and reserving orchiectomy along with the RPLND may seem like the best choice for this patient. And I know about this one. This one was an extreme uh, extent of it. When do you consider primary chemo? What, what are your numbers or what, what is the typical history? where you draw the line and say, this guy is for primary chemo rather than uh, doing the standard way. I think for somebody who's poor risk, like this patient, you know, a large mass, the patient is uh, somewhat symptomatic. I think all of this will push us towards doing chemotherapy first. Uh, archaeotomy can be done, but definitely there is going to be some delay, you know, having him to heal. So uh, for this patient, I think it will definitely be an easy decision to go with chemotherapy first. Thank you very much. So I just wanted to highlight this one as in there is always a discrepancy between EAU, EAU guidelines for the standard guidelines that we have used in England. So for us, there was no discrepancy, but India is a half mixture of both NCCN guidelines as well as the EAU guidelines. So depending on which guidelines you use, there seems to be a discrepancy. So I just wanted to highlight and learn from learned people as to say, why do we have this difference of opinion and where do we stand in the middle? Is there a compromise? So I've just taken this to 2021. What I have overlapped is the standard investigation of choice for a stage one seminoma is a contrast and CT chest abdomen and pelvis. That's one. The second part is the offer surveillance as a preferred option or carboplatin, one cycle of carboplatin as a, and both of them have got strong strength rating. The third, do not routinely perform adjuvant radiotherapy. So it is almost a negative one saying don't do it. And adjuvant radiotherapy should be resolved only for highly. Then the third is do not use PET CT or bone scan for staging. So this is from seminoma in the initial stages. So who is for surveillance, Amit, in India? So I think in our practice, uh, the, uh, the, um, at least my threshold for putting a patient in for surveillance is very, uh, so I don't, because the follow-up for these patients in our scenario is very, very difficult. difficult. So in a, in a selected patient who uh, doesn't fall into the so-called risk factor of that is a test involvement or a tumor no, side. I'll, I'll, then, I'll, I'll, so, I'll, I'll, I, 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 that wasn't what I wanted. What so I hardly, wanted. hardly, if you, if you want to ask the number, it is less than 10%. Majority of the patient, uh, at least in our scenario, we uh, uh, give them 
at least the uh, uh, carboplatin we because of the logistic and all that less than 10 percent patient goes or 10 20 percent but not beyond that goes for a surplus even in semi so, irrespective of the risk factor anybody who with a stage one seminoma because of the logistical problems as well as the compliance issue you would yes. treat them that's what would be yes okay. yes why a negative usage uh Prof. Nickel, I'm asking you because you were one of the co-authors of the guidelines. Why a negative usage statement? Are we doing harm by offering these patients radiotherapy? I think we're looking at, we have to separate patients out. And so it's not routinely. So that deviation from the previous reflex response, for everyone with stage one to get radiotherapy. I think we've heard about sort of second malignancies. And so it really comes down to who do you select for radiotherapy rather than being routinely used. And so the patients that we would use it in would be someone who would do very, would struggle with systemic chemotherapy with relapse. And so if someone is elderly, they've been um, long-term smoker, they have significant comorbidities, we would argue that in fact, the risk of second malignancy is probably diminished in that person compared to the morbidity of not treating the retroperitoneum. So we probably would in someone who's a, a stage stage one um, in, that, in that group. Whereas with a younger patient, there is the concern because they've got a very long time mm. at which they're exposed to the evolving risks of radiotherapy. So it's really just a qualifier. So I agree actually perhaps now that it's been highlighted, the wording may not be ideal. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll be looking at that. So it's really just to pick out who, who will be more likely to benefit and won't have the disadvantages to such an extent. Thank you. Then the next one, why PET-CT is not indicated? You're saying do not use positron emission tomography. Why so strong statement? Um, I guess it doesn't really add anything to CT scan. And okay. it, the difficulty is how do you manage positive results? And so if someone comes in with a testicular cancer, He's got a PET scan with something that's positive. Is that going to be a trigger to treat where, in fact, it's not related to his disease for some reason? So, okay. it, so it adds to the confusion rather than helping your clinical decision. Exactly. That's yeah. the reason why you said PET CT is not indicated. And when we cross the Atlantic, this is what we get. So stage 1A, 1B, surveillance, single agent carboplatin and RT. I just wanted to ask for my own understanding of NCC uh, Dr. Srinu, Prof. Srinivas, is this order of preference, though it is not mentioned? The first preference is surveillance, the second preference is carboplatin, and radiotherapy is a third preference. Is that yeah. correct understanding, ma'am? I agree. I mean, I think I uh, the majority of patients would undergo surveillance. I can't remember in the last decade if I've had any patient who's gotten radiation. Okay. Who is the ideal patient for radiotherapy, Veda? In a well, stage one uh, seminar. Just the opposite spectrum, as Amit said, uh, we really can't remember uh, only a handful of patients actually who are undergoing surveillance in India. So uh, ideal patient for RT obviously has to have the risk factors, first of all, uh, yeah. of relapse. Um, they should be uh, a typical patient who cannot follow up or doesn't understand the nuances of follow up active uh, surveillance. No, no, I wasn't uh, talking about that. I was uh, talking comparing between these two. When right. the patient you want to give either carbon platin or RT, so, you were saying this is a patient that I would like to use RT in a stage one seminoma. I don't think there is a specifically a specific okay. point to choose between the two. I I, I don't think so. Thank you. Uh, well, I would not give radiotherapy for a few patients if that helps. I would not do it for, say, a horseshoe kidney or patients who have had previous abdominal surgery or uh, some gastric peptic ulcer disease or something like that. But I, there's no other way to choose. Thank you. And this one here, uh, one cycle versus two cycle. Amit, how so, do you choose? So, so there is no one answer to the question. What I usually do, uh, if the patient tolerates first cycle of EUC7 without any complication, without any major uh, uh, toxicity, even, even any grade 3 toxicity, I offer them because the chances of a recurrence of uh, one cycle vis-a-vis -vis two cycle, the, the recurrence rate is further less. So in patients who is motivated, who understands without any complication to first cycle of carboplatin, I usually offer them the second cycle. But 
uh, if patient says that I don't want to take a, a, a second cycle, I don't force them for second cycle. Okay. So, so ideally, the, you would uh, like to give, can I just say ideally you would like to give two cycles, but majority of the time you end up giving one cycle. Am I right in saying that? Yes. Okay. Yes. Prof, you you want can, anything you to add to that, that ma'am? I was just saying that, you know, Raka, with two cycles, you decrease down to 1%. With one cycle, it's really down to about 3%. Ooh. So the, the real true benefit that you get with two is not that great. Okay. Uh, Kochika, sir? Yeah, I think in Indian perspective, you ask the sequence of sort of the choices, whether it's surveillance or carboplatin or CSRT. I think I will put it in a very simple fashion. In India, the patients do not come for regular follow-up. So certainly yeah. you treat these patients. So what is the best treatment? Either it's radiotherapy or single-agent carboplatin therapy. I personally feel, as Vedang has said, except the patients who have something like a horseshoe kidney, irritable bowel syndrome or bowel surgeries, they straight away out of that sort of radiation you know, option, they will go for chemotherapy. But in general, I feel rather than going in for six weeks or whatever duration of radiation you have, one single agent carboplatin would be really helpful in Indian circumstances. And we started doing this. I offer them only one cycle rather than two and follow them uh, quite regularly. You don't have to do vigorous follow-up as like surveillance. And that's the biggest advantage. So my choice is now patients who need it, do it one single agent carboplatin therapy as an adjuvant treatment. Thank you. Uh, why don't we use BEP? Let's say the patient has uh, both the risk factors. Yes, size, tumor, bigger, and involvement of the retty testis. Do you think you would, is BEP an overkill here, ma'am? Yes. Okay. Short That's answer. Uh, in, in two sentences, if you can, what does AUC7 mean? So essentially carboplatinum, that's the way it's dosed. You know, it's dosed based on body surface area, the weight and the creatinine clearance. And AUC is just area under the curve. It's picked based on different cancers. So for ovarian cancer, for instance, they use an AUC of uh, six. For lung cancers, as an AUC of five. In this study, they looked at patients who had an AUC less than seven had a worse outcome. So if you're doing it, it's really important that we keep up with that dose. So you mean to say it has to be below AUC seven or above AUC seven? No, it has to be an AUC of at least seven. At least seven. So yeah. it can be eight, but it has to be at least seven. Am I right in saying that? I don't know about eight. I mean, if you say seven, they come with a price, right? I mean, AUC of eight is going to increase the amount of carboplatinum that you give. There's definitely myelosuppression with it. So I think AUC of seven is what we would do if you're choosing to do it. Thank you. Prof. Nikol, you wanted to say something? Uh, no, it's just that some... Some centers I know use AUC 10 as a prophylactic dose for, for some reason. So, so there is some, some variance in, in the UK. There's a couple of the bigger centers also use that. Okay. Thank you. Vedan, when I'm shifting to the next one, what, what did you uh, want I to say? I just wanted to ask Andy and Amit maybe to uh, uh, highlight the importance of uh, calculating the GFR uh, properly while calculating the dose of uh, carboplatin. I mean, that can also affect what dose and uh, how you how effective the treatment finally is. Right. I mean, the calculation for AUC does take into consideration what the GFR is, and then you have to add 25 to GFR and then multiply it by what AUC you want. So part of A, when you say AUC 7, it takes that whole thing into consideration. Thank you. I would uh, skip the first question because Amit has already answered. Why is there no histological grading map for testicular tumors? As in high grade, low grade, intermediate grade? Actually, that's a good question. You know, I mean, I honestly don't know. I've never seen that being done. It's so, um, I think just grading as a low grade, intermediate grade and high grade probably is irrelevant for primary archaeotomy. Hmm. I think what I feel personally is I think the subtypes are more important rather than the grade itself. You know, the, how much is the component of embryonal cell carcinoma? How much is the yolk sac tumor? How much is like an exam cell tumor? That matters more, the quantification. And obviously, the MIB index and other things are more important than the uh, grades. Uh, and, so probably uh, it's a much more heterogeneous and more than one cell origin. That's the reason yeah, we yeah. Tend to, don't tend to have the grading. Okay, thank you. So I'll just uh, NSGCT stage one. So here, I just want to know, uh, 
Amit, if you had a patient, I know you don't tend to have them on surveillance, but you had a patient of stage one seminomatous germ cell tumor and a non seminomatous Which one are you worried about more? I think I think the patient is put on a surveillance. I think the NS seminoma may have a more protected course, but in NSGCT, if you are keeping a patient on surveillance, we have to be more uh, vigilant. We have the for the surveillance is more uh, 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 at less interval, uh, more rigorous. So I think for NSGCT, uh, we are more worried rather than the seminoma. Okay, so that's what we are worried about. And I've asked this question again. So this is the order of preference according to the N NCCN guidelines. And Prof. Nickel, do you do this often? Primary RPLND, clinical stage one? Uh, for germ cell tumors, incredibly rarely. Okay. Without the, the features that I mentioned. Um, yes, yes. But, but, but for germ cell tumors, the test is unless they've got PNET or something else nasty in them, no. Okay. And uh, Vedang, which one do you think will have a better outcome? Do you do any primary RPL? And I know there will be exceptions, but do you offer at the outset in this order, i.e. Well, without risk factors in this order? Uh, well, very few. I think we most of the patients with stage 1 NSGC go for uh, BEP. I think the order, Sanjay, is reversed. It is one BEP followed yes. by and then surveillance. So in the reverse order. Uh, yeah, it's pretty much uh, reverse. Okay, I did We are running behind schedule. Uh, Thank you. Okay, we are done. There are two two more uh, slides. Then we are done. So okay. in this one, what is SOC with respect to stage two seminomama, chemo or RT? I mean, I prefer um, chemotherapy. I think it's much easier to do chemotherapy. It would be a shame for that patient to have had radiation and then relapse in the lung because that definitely increases, you know, to do radiation and then add chemo. So I prefer chemotherapy, but certainly NCCN guidelines would have for 2A, RT would be the preferred treatment. Yes. And well, uh, if I may, uh, Sanjay, I think yep. uh, 2A is certainly a two centimeter tumor in the retroperitoneum or a one and a half centimeter tumor. Uh, three BEPs, I think, is just too much. We have seen the sequelae that happen. I mean, it is not an easy treatment. If it was one or two carboplatins, I would have said, okay, fine, please go ahead. But uh, I think uh, the burden of uh, second malignancies and late uh, sequelae should not be only carried by radiation. There's enough happening there, with certainly with three BEPs. So I would strongly recommend uh, to go with, uh, I mean, I, I would believe that uh, strongly, not just because I, I'm a radiation oncologist. Okay, I, I just wanted a sentence from Sandison. Is 3 BEP equivalent to 4 EP, ma'am? Yes. Or you would always prefer 3 BEP unless you could not give the B, then you come to 4 EP. I prefer 3 BEP because I think, you know, the increased platinum, that's another 100 of platinum for the fourth cycle. There's another uh, etoposide that definitely increases the risk of leukemias. So if I can get by with 3 BEP, that would be my first choice. Okay. Thank you very much. And I think this question has been answered. Prof. Nikhil and Makran, sir, is marker negative stage 2A NSGCT the best indication for primary RPLND currently? Um, still, we haven't sorry. Still, we haven't heard much about it. We don't have much evidence about it, but it's very exciting, you know, doing that uh, marker test as such. Um, the future will tell us. But in in my experience, I personally feel the RPLND is probably primary RPLND is an overkill. Uh, it's a bigger operation, challenging, other complications. Why not give them, you know, one dose of chemo and that's it, you know, and reduce the frequency of follow up. Prof. David. So we're, we're, we're talking about clinical stage two non-seminoma. Yes, non-seminoma. Marker um, negative. Well, I, I per personally believe that if it's if it's marker negative, and the exception would be a mixed germ cell tumor comprising purely embryonal carcinoma and seminoma, or pure embryonal carcinoma. But outside that, I think it's it's a prime indication because you're otherwise going to subject patients who may have teratoma that's not going to respond to chemotherapy, and they're exposed to three cycles of of BEP. And so they can end up with all sorts of ringing in their ears, numb feet, and other toxicities when, in fact, they actually needed surgery from the outset. They've got Thank small you. volume disease by definition. And so even if they've got malignant disease, you can then go back and treat them with adjuvant 
chemotherapy is one or two cycles of BEP. So, so you agree with this statement? If there was an yes. indication for primary alp, that's one. Yes. And second, uh, son, this is the last question. Expression of marker, is it an indication of aggressive nature or they tend to, because here, if you just look at it, there comes chemotherapy, there comes surgery. Is it an indication of chemosensitivity or non-functioning of surgery? I mean, I think the markers just help us uh, reinforce viable malignant component as opposed to marker negative being more likely to be a teratoma. I don't necessarily think it's going to say that it's chemosensitivity. I mean, they will be chemosensitive, but I think the presence of marker just uh, predicts for a malignant component. Thank you very much. Thank you. 36 minutes. Thank you, Dr. Sanjay. Uh, so Thank it was going you. great, actually. Uh, Esteemed panel, I, I have never had so many learned people on my panel. Professor Nikhil, it yeah. was an honor. Sandy Srinivas, ma'am, it was an honor. And Veda. Thank you. Thank you, all the panelists. The, the problem of giving the task to Sanjay is that he does it so well that uh, people don't want to end, you know. But uh, we've been going really overboard time. And uh, I would like to call uh, Dr. Raghunath, our convener uh, of the subsection, to give the board of thanks and wind up the meeting. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gagan. Uh, very good evening to all of you. Uh, I know it's uh, almost, uh, we are 40 minutes late. Uh, I would like to give a very brief summary uh, and closing remarks. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank, uh, uh, you know, USA and ISU for this opportunity and particularly Dr. Keshav Murthy for uh, uh, guiding and supporting uh, in planning and curating this uh, program. Uh, I must thank and congratulate uh, Dr. Gagan, Joy, and uh, Euro Oncology staff members, Dr. Jitin and uh, Dr. Sanjay, for crafting this program and curating this so well. All the speakers did a marvelous job. Uh, Dr. Jitin covered testicular microtheasis, evaluation of testicular tumors, and uh, the importance of uh, intertesticular neoplasia so well. And uh, Dr. Nichols' indication for RPLND, though time is not there, but I would recapitulate the indications briefly. The stage one high risk NSGCT, uh, particularly uh, the pathological stage one, 10% relapse can be there, and pathological stage two, 30% relapse can be there. And RPLND is also indicated in uh, you know rare tumors, particularly stage one PNET and uh, rhabdo sarcoma. Uh, stage 2A and 2B seminoma, there is some evolving role for RPLND with adjuvant chemotherapy. Of course, this trial is going on at uh, Royal Marsden. Uh, salvage, he covered salvage RPLND, desperation or RPLND whenever uh, elevated markers are there. And one important thing is, if it is possible to resect all the sites, then only we should plan for this. Go growing teratoma syndrome and very late relapses. He alluded the importance of, uh, you know, uh, RPLND should be done in a very high volume center. It should not be taken up uh, in a small volume centers. And judgment and experience is of paramount importance. He also covered mistakes of doing RPLND. And when it comes to the surgical techniques, there was a time where we used to depend on foreign faculty to show all these, you know, high-end so-called complicated videos. But all these were covered by Indian faculty young Indian faculty to start with uh, the surgical technique by open was shown in a best possible way by uh, Dr. Ravi in an extra peritoneal and uh, uh, Dr. Ginil covered uh, retro peritoneal robotic approach and Dr. Mahendra and Anand Raja covered all the now sparing uh, techniques beautifully well. And I must remember Dr. Ginil got third prize in ERAS for his uh, excellent video. And Dr. Sudhir Rawal's last experience, he covered uh, evolution, evidence, and uh, techniques of RPLND was so superb. And we learned a lot. And with this webinar, probably uh, young uro uro oncologists and urologists uh, probably would start learning and understanding RPLND in a better way. And definitely it's going to uh, you know, uh, benefit the patients. And Dr. Vedang gave a very comprehensive and good perspective about the indications and utility of RT in testicular tumors. The Ganesh Bakshi's survivorship is an eye opener because as a clinician, as a treating physician and surgeons, we generally don't think about long-term consequences of either surgery or uh, you know, chemotherapy or radiotherapy. He covered so well. Uh, Dr. Sandish uh, Srinivas, uh, treatment selection 
uh, based on IgCCCG uh, risk stratification and role of mRNA was very precise. Uh, as always, Dr. Sanjay did a marvelous job. It was an excellent uh, panel discussion. I thank Dr. Sanjay and all the panelists. Uh, he covered all practical aspects about testicular tumors, which is very difficult to be covered in any didactic lectures. I also thank uh, Dr. Amle Seth for uh, chairing and moderating uh, the session one. Uh, I again thank Dr. Gagan and uh, Joy for crafting and curating this program so well. I also especially thank Dr. David and uh, Dr. Sandy Srinivas for their participation and sharing their experience and knowledge. With this, we have come to the end of uh, um, this webinar. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Oh.